bring up the presentation. Excellent. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, we will be talking about um, an introduction to beekeeping. My name is Patrick Byers. I'm a horticulture field specialist with the University of Missouri Extension. Let me wait till these control boxes disappear. Okay, uh, let's go on back. So again, I'm Patrick Byers, horticulture field specialist with the University of Missouri Extension, and we'll be talking about beginning in bee beekeeping this evening. And again, this is a, a uh, just a very brief introduction to several aspects of beekeeping. It's it's designed to pique your interest and and hopefully uh, encourage a, a, a further investigation of the joys and, and pleasures of beekeeping. Tonight, as we go through this material, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat. And my co-host Anna will be keeping an eye on that, and we'll tackle those questions as we go through this. So, let's go ahead and get started. As Anna mentioned, this uh, workshop tonight is sponsored by Springfield Community Gardens and the vision of Springfield Community Gardens is a community where everyone has access to healthy local foods. Springfield Community Gardens maintains a network of community gardens across Greene County, Missouri. They also have a very innovative farmer incubator program and a more, more uh, very recent project is the development of a hospital garden. So for more information about Springfield Community Gardens and their, their projects and their mission, check out their uh, website, check out their Facebook site. Uh, I'll mention that uh, tonight's workshop is one in a series and uh, these workshops are all uh, announced and publicized through the uh, Springfield Community Gardens Facebook site. The other partner in this evening's workshop is the USDA. And Springfield Community Gardens has received several grants to support their mission. And part of those grants is an outreach aspect, and that's where I come in as a horticulture field specialist with University of Missouri Extension. I partner with Springfield Community Gardens to put on these workshops. Uh, the workshops are funded in part through USDA and through the, uh, the grants received. And we will ask you at the end of our uh, workshop this evening to fill out a brief survey to give us a feel for the, uh, the uh, workshop this evening. This is very helpful for myself to, to help me improve continuously as I develop workshops, but it's also required for us to report back to our funders. So we appreciate your help with the, uh, the impact survey. The uh, Farm Services Agency is the gateway to uh, USDA services. And these services are in place to support agriculture in all of its aspects in, in the United States. And that includes small scale specialty crop agriculture. The uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service or NRCS has a number of programs in place to uh, offset some of the costs of farming. So it's it's definitely in your interest as uh, beginning farmers to investigate the uh, the various programs that are available through NRCS and through FSA. Other agencies such as the Risk Management Agency also have services in place to support farmers and all of these resources are described on the farmers.gov uh, resource website. Hi Patrick, we have a question. Yes. Um, so an anonymous attendee asks hospital garden. I think that's directed a little bit more towards the Springfield Community Garden side of things. I'd be happy to do that real quickly. Sure. Okay, so um, basically uh, SCG has a partnership with Cox Health, which is a very large hospital system in this area. Um, and we currently have a community garden at their north campus, but we're expanding that. Um, into a hospital farm actually at their Cox South location. It'll be called the Amanda Bell Farm. And our hope for that is to connect patients and staff members with really local fresh food um, in the hospital. Um, we'll be partnering with them in their cafeteria to get that fresh produce to patients. And also we're going to be uh, beginning a community sourced agriculture, a CSA for uh, hospital staff members. So. Um, that farm is currently being built um, and will be in um, effect in the next year. We'll be starting the CSA and, and partnering with them. So that's kind of what the hospital farm is about. A very exciting project, very exciting. And it's been a pleasure to be involved with that project. This is an outline of what I'd like to cover tonight. And again, this is just an overview of beekeeping. And um, as we go through the material, as I've mentioned this before, but as we go through the material, please uh, ask any questions and we'll tackle them. Well, first of all, have an introduction and a bit of a reality check for those who are thinking about beekeeping. We'll talk about the history and the importance of honeybees. Honeybees and humans have been associated for millennia. 
And it's a very interesting and very important relationship. Then we'll talk about honeybees themselves. We'll talk about their physical characteristics and a bit about their life cycles and their biology. And then we'll get into sort of the, the main part of our time here tonight, and that's getting started in beekeeping. And we'll talk about hive types, we'll talk about equipment, and we'll talk about obtaining bees. And um, we'll have several videos to supplement uh, this part of the presentation. We'll have a discussion on pest diseases and integrated pest management. Now, we're not going to be able to go into detail. Again, this is definitely the subject matter of several workshops, but we will look at Varroa mites as a case study from the standpoint of integrated pest management of honeybee problems. We'll talk about honeybees and pollination, and we'll talk about bee products, and then we'll wind up with just a discussion of keeping honeybees in urban areas. That's a little bit different than keeping honeybees on the farm, but I know that several of the folks who are on the uh, webinar this evening uh, live, in, live in urban areas, and they may be considering uh, becoming beekeepers in an urban setting. So you're interested in keeping bees. Well, I, I salute you. I congratulate you. It can be the start of a fascinating hobby and, and perhaps even a venture into the commercial aspects of beekeeping. But again, it's important to do a reality check. You know, first of all, is this going to be a hobby or are you thinking about it from the standpoint of making money from your, your uh, beekeeping enterprise? Uh, very important to think about that because you're going to have a different approach to uh, the material that I'll cover tonight if you're a hobbyist than if you're a commercial beekeeper. Um, are these bees going to be in your backyard, just a few hives, uh, something that you manage for the pleasure of it? Or is it going to grow to the scale again where you might be considering uh, commercial production of bees and bee products? How many hives do you want to have? Uh, do you plan to make money from pollination services? This is definitely an opportunity for those uh, for, for beekeepers. Now it comes with some challenges as we'll talk about a little bit later on in the presentation. Or, and is your goal making money, uh, perhaps selling honey, perhaps selling other bee products? So again, ask yourself these questions at the very beginning of your interest in beekeeping. And, and honestly, many people start out as hobbyist beekeepers. And as I said before, it can be a very enjoyable, very fulfilling hobby. And then as they discover they have an aptitude and an interest in beekeeping, then perhaps they expand to the commercial scale. So oftentimes people's experience with beekeeping is, is a bit of a journey, starting at the hobby level and then expanding on perhaps into a larger scale production. And now for the reality check, bees will sting, you will get stung and it hurts. Now, uh, there are people who have a sensitivity to bee stings and there are beekeepers who have sensitivities to bee stings and they keep EpiPens and, and other antidotes close at hand. But keep in mind that if you do have a sensitive to, to bee, if you're sensitive to bee venom, it may be a, a bit of a sign, a bit of a signal that perhaps beekeeping is not for you because it is inevitable that people who keep bees will get stung. Secondly, bees will not recognize you as a friend. Uh, quite frankly, it's a bit of a truce between the beekeeper and the honeybee. And in fact, as you work with, with, uh, with honeybees, and in many cases, they perceive you as the enemy. And the, the way that you manage them is, is in an effort to overcome this, this um, uh, alarm reaction, which is natural. You know, you think about opening a hive, this is pretty disruptive from the standpoint of the honeybee. And uh, uh, that, it's, it's just important to recognize that, that honeybees do not become your friends. Beekeeping is expensive. We'll talk a little bit about the costs of getting into beekeeping a little bit later on. Bees do not take care of themselves. It's a mistake to, to go to the expense to establish a colony and then not manage it because bees will not take care of themselves. And in fact, in, in today's atmosphere with, with some of the uh, pest issues with bees, if they're not managed, if a colony is not managed, sooner or later, it will likely succumb to, to one or more problems. Uh, beekeeping can be physically taxing. Lifting the equipment, lifting uh, uh, bee boxes or supers can be physically exhausting. And particularly if, if a, a, a person expands to the scale of commercial beekeeping. So this must be kept in mind too. It's risky to try to make money with beekeeping. And those people who have, uh, have had long-term success with beekeeping have, have figured out how to overcome those risks. And, and again, uh, it's a reality check that you can make a bit of money off of a backyard, um, uh, backyard apiary, but from the standpoint of, of uh, uh, a commercial venture into beekeeping, you typically have to go big. Now, what does big mean? Um, many commercial beekeepers will tell you that, that that's around 50 colonies. So it is important to recognize that if you decide to go the route of commercial beekeeping, that you're going to have to go, go big. 
Now let's talk a little bit about the history and the importance of honeybees. This is a very interesting picture here. This is actually a, a cave painting. This was found in a cave in France, and it's to believe, believed to be one of the earliest depictions of a human harvesting honey. And again, if you look at this uh, uh, with, with uh, you know, a bit of an abstract eye, you can see a person uh, obviously clinging to a tree or perhaps to the side of a wall or, or a cliff, reaching into to something and, and putting something into a container that they're holding. But what perhaps is most revealing are the, uh, the objects flying around that person, which to my eye look like honeybees. So again, this association between humans and honeybees goes back millennia goes back to, to the early part of our experience as, as, uh, as humans, and certainly back to the period of time when we were hunters or gatherers. Uh, it's been said that oftentimes the, uh, one of the most important quests among humans is the quest for sweetness. And um, honey is a naturally occurring sweetener, and it was widely utilized in the ancient world. And so again, looking at this picture, we can imagine uh, one of our, our early ancestors harvesting honey and, and braving the stings of those bees that are flying around. When we talk about the uh, European honeybee, it, it, it can be helpful to understand um, uh, its uh, uh, species relationship. And, and certainly it's in the, the animal kingdom, it's in the arthropod phylum, which includes uh, things such as insects, spiders, and uh, a number of other organisms that have outer skeletons or exoskeletons. It be, belongs to the class Insecta, belongs to the order Hymenoptera. And uh, Hymenoptera includes a number of other insects of interest. It includes wasps, it includes um, uh, the ants, and uh, certainly it includes the honeybees and, and, and their relatives. Uh, the honeybee belongs to the family Apidae, and it's the genus Apis and the species Apis mellifera. And it's interesting when we look at uh, that, that word, uh, Apis mellifera, these are two Latin words that mean honey bearing. So again, from the very beginning, when, when uh, this insect was named, it was, it was named in honor of the fact that it is definitely a honey-bearing insect. Now, you sometimes hear the term apiculture or apiary. Uh, apiculture is bee, beekeeping. An apiary is an is area where honeybee hives are kept. And those are derived from the Latin name of the European honeybee, which is, of course, apis. Now, the early history of the honeybee. Again, humans and, and honeybees have been connected for at least 8,000 years and likely longer too. And honey was the earliest of sweeteners. Um, honeybees are not native to the New World. They're not native to North America. They're actually an old world species. And uh, the nearest indications we have is that uh, the uh, European honeybee likely originated somewhere in, in uh, Eastern or Southern Europe. Uh, early on, it was brought to the New World, and it was brought to the New World certainly because, you know, honey was an important sweetener. But uh, again, fairly quickly, it was recognized that uh, honeybees had a value as pollinators, and we'll talk more about that here in a moment. And then perhaps not as important today, but very important in the past, was the wax produced by honeybees. And in fact, much of the early beekeeping was uh, done with the goal of harvesting the wax that honeybees produce. Now, as far as the importance of the honeybee, you know, certainly there's a relationship between humans and honeybees, but uh, it goes beyond just a, uh, uh, a source of something sweet. And honeybees actually co-evolved along with modern agriculture. In other words, the, the, uh, the relationship with humans evolved along with the development of modern agriculture by humans. And humans recognized early on that honeybees were a partner with many of the crops that they wished to grow. We'll talk more about that when we get to our section on pollination. Honeybees perform 5 to 30% of pollination. Uh, it's been estimated that uh, 1 in 10 or perhaps even more than that uh, mouthfuls of food that we eat is uh, there directly as the result of honeybee pollination. And in fact, if we look at the value of honeybees in agriculture, they're worth more as pollinators than as honey producers. And uh, again, native, native pollinators certainly have a role to play, and, and we, we want to recognize that. But honeybees are crucial, and partly because honeybees can be managed, and partly because honeybees can be moved. And a little bit later on, we'll talk about migratory beekeeping and migratory pollination. So some milestones in, in the recent relationship between honeybees and humans. Uh, the gentleman in this picture, Reverend Lorenzo Langstroth, uh, we, we should all uh, bow our heads in thanksgiving to a Reverend Langstroth, uh, he early on recognized something, a very important concept called the bee space. And we'll talk more about that here in a moment as well. 
But in 1852, he patented the movable frame hive. And this was the first uh, commercially available hive where a beekeeper could take it apart into pieces and pull out components and examine the bees. Uh, prior to Reverend Langstroth's uh, uh, development, bees were kept in things such as hollow logs or, uh, or straw baskets or, or boxes. And in these settings, the, uh, the uh, bees would fill the area with comb and with, with uh, honey. But when it came time to harvest the honey, the only alternative was to destroy the colony. But with the uh, Langstroth hive, as we'll talk about here in a moment, we can now pull components out, we can brush the bees off, and we can harvest honey and wax from those components without destroying the colony. So again, this was a, a revolutionary development. 1857, we saw the invention of comb foundation. We'll talk more about that here in a moment. But that is the material that we can place within the Langstroth hive to help guide the development of the honeycomb within the hive. 1865, the invention of the honey extractor. Again, prior to having honey extractors, honey was, was collected by crushing the comb and uh, collecting the honey. Again, this was, was obviously disruptive to the colony. But with a honey extractor now combined with a Langstroth hive, we can now pull frames out. We can cut the caps off those frames. And with the extractor, we can, we can uh, drive the honey out of the comb and then replace the frames and the uh, comb back into the hive. 1865, we saw the importation of Italian honeybee queens into uh, the United States. And this was a huge development. We'll talk more about Italian honeybees here in a moment, but it proved to be a very productive, very easily managed strain of honeybee. 1883, the first US bee laws. Uh, beekeeping is regulated by the USDA and commercial beekeepers have to adhere to the uh, regulations in place at, at the federal level. There are also state laws that regulate beekeeping. 1998, uh, this is a fairly recent development, but movable frame hives were required for, for most commercial beekeeping applications. And then 2006, this was the first year that we had a widespread report of colony collapse disorder. This has been extremely disruptive to beekeeping, both at the hobby level and also at the commercial level. And for example, in the seven years between 2006 and 2013, uh, US beekeepers lost 10 million colonies. This is just an astonishing number. And we'll talk more about colony collapse disorder a little bit later on. Now, where are we as far as colony numbers in the United States? Well, at the present uh, time, we are definitely down from the peak. The peak was in 1947 when we had 6 million hives. Uh, the most recent information we have was as the result of the US Census of Agriculture in 2017, where it was estimated that there were 2.62 million colonies. Um, in 2016, there were about 125,000 beekeepers. Uh, 1,600 of these were commercial beekeepers. The rest were people like you and I, hobbyists who had less than 25 colonies or part-time uh, commercial beekeepers who had less than 300 colonies. So again, um, the uh, 1,600 commercial beekeepers, they account for a good part of the, the bee colonies, but hobbyists and part-time beekeepers are important as well. And we're seeing this huge, huge uh, building of interest in beekeeping, especially in urban areas. And again, I suspect many of the folks on the, uh, the workshop this evening may live in urban or suburban areas and are thinking about uh, beekeeping. Some of you may already have hives. Okay, now let's talk about honeybee biology. It's a fascinating insect. And I think it's important to understand biology to become a, a good beekeeper. We have to understand how bees function, what's, what is important about their life cycles and, uh, and uh, their behaviors so that we can adapt what we do to help manage their colonies effectively. So a honeybee life cycle is uh, from, from egg to adult is about 21 days in the case of a worker bee. It's a few days longer in the case of a, of a queen or a, uh, a drone bee. But basically there are four life stages for a honeybee. Those stages are egg, larva, pupae, and adult. And so the egg is laid and in six days it hatches into the larva. And then the larva is in place uh, until about day 15. At that point, it pupates, forms the pupa. And then about day 21 is when the pupa then hatches or, or uh, uh, develops into the adult bee. So again, a very interesting life cycle, but not all that unusual compared to other insects. 
And again, an egg for, for about the first three days, a larva then from day four to day 10, a pupa from day 11 to day 20. The uh, uh, developing larva and the pupa are tended by uh, the, the worker bees, and then the worker bees cap the cell. The uh, uh, pupa then, when it emerges as a new adult, the new adult chews out of the cell and becomes a, a, a productive part of the hive. Now, as far as the adult life cycle, uh, the adult worker bees begin life as what are called nurse bees. They stay in the colony. They tend to the eggs, to the developing larva. They have housekeeping duties. They tend to the queen. And this lasts for about the first 22 days or so of their lives. And then from, from that point on, they become foraging adults if it's during the, uh, the uh, uh, nectar flow, during the time of the season when, when flowers are blossoming and producing nectar. And they, they uh, will then be uh, foraging adults that leave the hive collect nectar and pollen and return back to the hive with, with those important foodstuffs for the colony. Now, within the, the honeybee colony, there are three castes or, or types of bees. And these are the queen, the worker, and the drone. And we'll talk more about the roles of each one here in a moment. But each of these castes has a specific role in, in the colony, and they all work together for the good of the colony. When we think about cooperative behavior, a honeybee colony is, is an excellent example. And when everything is, is going right, the, uh, the honeybee colony is productive. It produces enough honey and enough uh, stored foods to support the life of the colony with excess that can then be collected by the beekeeper. Now, if the cast system is not working properly, if there's disruption of the, uh, the behavior patterns within the colony, then we have problems and we can have declines in colonies or even, even colony die off because of problems with, with uh, the behavior of one or more of the uh, honeybee casts. So let's talk about the queen first. The queen is the largest honeybee in the colony and there's usually only one per colony. Um, she's typically about 18 to 20 millimeters long. She's the longest lived bee in the colony. She can have a lifespan of up to six years. Her job in the colony, again, is to control the behavior of the colony and to lay eggs. And she lays lots of eggs, up to 1,500 eggs per day. Um, it's very interesting, the, the, uh, uh, when, it, when a, a uh, queen hatches, when, when she emerges from the cell where she develops, she's a virgin, she's not mated. She goes on a mating flight, she mates at that time with, with several drones, which we'll talk about here in a moment, but that's the only time she mates. And then she stores up enough spermatozoa in her body to continuously fertilize eggs at the rate of up to 1,500 eggs per day for a number of years. It's just remarkable to consider that. Now, the uh, queen has the ability to choose whether or not she lays fertilized or unfertilized eggs. Uh, the fertilized eggs that she lay, lays become females. And uh, the uh, diet that these developing females are fed, the female larva are fed, determines whether or not they'll develop into worker bees, which are females as well, or into additional queens. Um, if she lays unfertilized eggs, these become drones. And the queen basically controls the behavior of the hive. She holds the hive together through the production of pheromones. And we'll talk more about pheromones here in a moment as well. But pheromones are scents that are released by bees in response to, to particular uh, circumstances. And the queen releases a series of pheromones that help direct the behavior of the bees, both within the hive and, and as they forage. And again, if a bee is old or if a bee is, is otherwise, a queen is, is old or otherwise in decline, uh, this affects her production of pheromones. And this in turn can affect the behavior of, of, of the uh, worker bees where they might actually begin to uh, develop new queens to replace a failing queen. So again, a lot of the management of a hive comes down to sense, comes down to pheromones. Now, a new queen, a virgin queen, after hatching, she'll make mating flights. And those are flights up into the air uh, above the uh, colony. At that point, uh, it's interesting to watch this happen. As she leaves the colony, the drones that are present will immediately fly up after her in spiraling flights, and they actually mate in midair. Uh, she can make up to five to seven mating flights. She can mate with up to 15 drones during that period of time. And then again, she stores that sperm in her body from that point on. She doesn't mate again. And it, again, it's, it's just fascinating to me that, that the queen can determine whether or not an egg is fertilized as she lays it. Uh, after the mating flight, she, re she returns to the hive and that she does not leave the hive again during her lifetime unless she joins the swarm. 
she may live up to six years. And again, she's tended by the worker bees and she controls their behavior through the production of pheromones. The worker bee, by far the majority of the bees in a colony in a hive are female worker bees. There can be up to 60,000 worker bees present in a strong colony at the peak of the season. Typically a worker bee has a fairly short lifespan and it's partly because they work for that entire lifespan. Uh, typically during the, uh, the uh, uh, flowering season, during the spring, summer and fall, it's about a six week lifespan. Now the bees that are present during the winter, the, the worker bees will live a longer period of time. They can actually live for the better part of the winter. But again, bees don't have a, worker bees don't have a long lifespan because they quite frankly work themselves to death. They do all of the work. They're the guard bees, they're the nurse bees. They take care of housekeeping activities, you know, cleaning the hive and, and uh, removing debris, et cetera. And they're also the foragers that gather pollen and nectar that provide the stores that support the life of the hive. They're about 10 to 15 millimeters long. And again, as we mentioned earlier, uh, when a worker bee emerges from, from her cell, she spends about four weeks as a house bee, as a nurse bee in the hive, and then she becomes a forager for the remainder of her lifespan. The drone beans are male. The, uh, the drone bee develops from an unfertilized egg. Uh, drones do no work in the hive. In fact, they, <laughs> quite frankly, are, are a bit of a drain on the hive. The workers must feed them. Uh, they, they loaf around on the hive. They get in the way of activities. They're a little bit larger than worker bees. They're about 15 to 17 millimeters long. Uh, they don't have a stinger. They have large eyes, as we can see. And, and the, one of the reasons they have large eyes is really their only job in life is to mate with the queen. And as the uh, virgin queen leaves on her mating flights, those eyes serve the drones well to pursue her into the air. Um, after they mate, they die. And if there are any left in the hive in the fall, the uh, worker bees, quite frankly, kick them out. They're, they're kicked out of the hive and then they perish. Now let's take a little uh, bit of a, of a look at a bee and its body. And when we look particularly at worker bees, we notice that uh, they're hairy. Most of their body is covered with hairs of, of, of uh, one sort or another. And particularly when, when the bees are young, they, their bodies are, are thickly covered with hairs. As bees age and particularly foraging bees, as they've been working, oftentimes they'll wear some of this hair off. But this hair is important because it traps and transfers pollen. We'll see a picture here in a moment. That, that shows how effective the body of the bee is in, trans, in trapping and transferring pollen. And once the pollen is collected on the bee's body, then the bee can actually uh, groom that pollen and collect it in what's called the pollen basket or the corbiculae. And this is found on their, their uh, rear legs. The uh, body color of the honeybee can vary depending upon its race. Some bees are nearly black, others are golden or almost yellow in color. Uh, in addition to the corbicula, the uh, bee has wax glands on its body. And these wax glands, of course, are used to produce beeswax, which is used to draw out the comb in which um, uh, larval bees develop and, and in which uh, bees store pollen and, uh, and honey. And then at the tip of the abdomen, the bee has a stinger. Now, the uh, stinger anatomy, which we'll see here in a moment, is barbed on workers. And a worker can only sting once. Once, If a worker bee stings, the uh, barbs on the... Uh, the uh, stinger stay behind in whatever the, the worker bee stung. And as the worker bee draws away, it actually pulls out the venom sac and a portion of the uh, honeybee's anatomy. And the honeybee then, the worker bee then quickly dies. Uh, the um, stinger on a queen is smooth. It does not stay behind in whatever's being stung. And typically the only reason that the queen bee would use its stinger would be to sting other competing queens within the colony. Here's a couple of interesting pictures. If we look at the picture on the left, we can see a, a worker bee foraging on dead nettle. Dead nettle is an early season, it's a cool season wheat, but it blooms early and it's an important pollen source for honeybees early in the season. And you notice that orange spot on the forehead of the honeybee. Well, the uh, floral arrangement in dead nettle has the stamens which produce the pollen on the top of the flower. And as the honeybee pushes her head into that flower to seek the nectar at the base of the flower, her head comes into contact with the, uh, the stamens and she gets a heavy dusting of pollen on her forehead. And then she, as she pulls away, she'll groom that off. And you'll notice in the lower picture, those um, uh, reddish colored areas, those are the uh, corbiculae, the uh, pollen baskets on the hind legs of this worker bee. 
and she has actually groomed the pollen off of her head and her body and collected it there so she can carry it back to the hive on her legs. Now the honey stomach, you know, we sometimes hear people say, well, honey is, is just something bees eat and then they throw back up. But in fact, a honeybee has a separate organ called the honey stomach where the uh, uh, nectar that she collects from a flower is stored on the way back to the hive. And if we look at this picture, we can see there in her abdomen, the honey stomach, it is separate from her, her uh, 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 normal stomach, you know, where she takes in food, digests this, and then excretes through the rectum. The honey stomach uh, is a separate organ. It allows her to draw in honey through her mouth parts. The honey is stored in the honey stomach. And then when she gets back to the hive, she regurgitates the, the uh, nectar where it's placed into uh, cells and then the excess moisture is uh, ev evaporated. So again, it's definitely separate from her regular stomach and does no digestion. Now let's take a look at the stinger. And again, as I said before, if you're interested in keeping bees, sooner or later, you're going to be stung. Um, the stinger is of course a defense mechanism and um, it's found at the tip of the abdomen, the, the, the third body part of, of the worker bee and the uh, queen bee. And in the case of the worker bee, it's, it's barbed. And if we look closely at that picture on the right, we can see the barbs out near the tip of the, uh, the stinger. Now the stinger actually has two parts that actually move in unison after uh, someone is stung or after something is stung and it actually works its way into the flesh of whatever was stung. Um, the uh, venom sac contains the uh, bee venom and it is connected to the, uh, the stinger by what's called the bulb. And again, if you look at the picture on the left, you can see those parts of the, uh, of the stinger. The valves actually uh, open up when the stinging takes place, releases the venom into the stinger. And then as the bee draws away, the stinger, the bulb, and the venom sac are pulled out of its abdomen and they remain behind in the wound uh, for a period of time, the venom sac will continue to pump venom into the wound. And as I said before, the, the uh, parts of the stinger will continue to move and draw the stinger deeper into the, uh, the flesh of whatever has been stung. Now, a bit of advice, if you get stung, it's important to remove the stinger as quickly as possible. Now, you don't wanna do this by squeezing it and pulling it out because if you squeeze it with your fingers, you actually will force additional venom into the wound. It's better to take a thumbnail or the blade of a knife or the uh, blade of a uh, hive tool and scrape the stinger out of, out of your body. That way you remove it, uh, you don't press the venom further into, into the wound. And the sooner you do that, the less venom will be injected. If you wait a period of time, obviously more venom will be injected. And then some thoughts on pheromones. So many animals communicate by way of pheromones. And this includes humans, believe it or not. Uh, it's, it's a way that we, we communicate, we meaning animals communicate beyond behavior, beyond uh, other cues. And uh, these scents can have many different purposes. Uh, honeybees, again, are very much rely upon scents to keep the hive operating smoothly. They rely upon these pheromones. Uh, there are numerous pheromones that have been identified in relationship to honeybees, but there's three that we're particularly interested in as far as beekeepers. Okay, the first is the queen pheromone. This is the pheromone that the queen releases that, that controls the behavior of the hive. And again, a strong, healthy queen releases uh, the right type of pheromone. It's in the right concentration in the hive and all goes well. But if she's failing or if she's been injured, then oftentimes pheromone production will be disrupted and the colony can sense this. And immediately they'll go into survival mode. They'll try to produce additional queens to replace the failing or the injured queen. The orientation pheromone, this is a very important pheromones that uh, honeybees release that helps communicate or helps guide them uh, to and from the colony. It's also a pheromone that is released within the colony to guide movement within the colony. And so again, that's very interesting. Uh, it's also an important pheromone that's released during the swarming process. And if we look at this picture here, we can see a swarm up in a peach tree and we can see all the bees flying in the same direction towards the uh, the uh, swarm. And this is because the uh, worker bees have released pheromones that help guide this sort of behavior. And the balling or the massing of the bees within the swarm, again, is as a result of these orientation pheromones. And then the third pheromone, the one that sooner or later you'll experience is the alarm pheromone. And when you're working with bees, as you open colonies and, and look at the inner workings, sooner or later, you're going to catch a whiff of the alarm pheromone. And it's, it's a, a scent that you can recognize it smells a bit like bananas, 
but again, very noticeable. And when you smell that pheromone, again, that is a response of bees to something that's disrupted the colony. And the, the response when something is disrupting the colony is first of all, investigation, and secondly, stinging. So uh, when we manage colonies, uh, if we begin to smell that pheromone, it's a good, good uh, sign that perhaps we need to do something about that, either back away and let things calm down, or perhaps through the judicious and careful use of smoke, we can actually disrupt the alarm pheromones and, and help, um, help calm the bees, help make them more docile and easy to work. Okay, do we have any questions at, at uh, this point, Anna? No questions right now. Okay, and again, I'll encourage everyone on the, uh, the webinar to please type questions into the chat. And, and we'll tackle them. And I, I'm very comfortable in any direction that the discussion goes. So if you have any questions or observations relative to uh, what we're talking about, or even if it's something we haven't talked about, type into the chat and we'll tackle it. Now let's talk about honeybee strains. So when we think about um, honey producing bees, you know, there, there are literally thousands of bees, but there's really only a few that produce honey in quantity enough that they can be harvested by humans. And these include the giant bees of Asia, the uh, uh, little honeybee and eastern honeybee, again, of Asia and Europe, and then the western honeybee, primarily of Europe. Notice that none of these are native to North America. Uh, the, uh, the bee species that we have in this country are very important from the standpoint of pollination and, and, and other, other aspects, but uh, they're not honey-producing bees. Uh, Apis mellifera, which is the western honeybee, is by far the dominant honeybee species in the world, and it was early on brought to the U.S. Now, it's made up of several subspecies that are capable of interbreeding, and in, in uh, many cases, these have been developed into what we call strains. There's at least nine different races or strains of honeybees, and uh, Again, these would be related to those that are recognized by, by beekeepers. There's likely many, many more when we take into consideration uh, feral bees. But from the standpoint of, of um, uh, apiculture, from the standpoint of beekeeping, uh, these are the primary types of honeybees that are kept. And each race has positive and negative attributes. You know, some, for example, are, are uh, types of bees that build up strength early in the spring. Others have uh, hygienic behavior where they groom themselves and help dislodge uh, external parasites. Others produce a lot of honey. Others are, are more defensive about their colonies. Some even have negative attributes. A good example would be Africanized bees, which are, are uh, honeybees, yes, but they have developed aggressive tendencies. Uh, these races actually allow for specialization in, in the apiary. Now we have some standard races that have been uh, part of beekeeping for many, many years. You know, Italian bees are are uh, probably one of the most widely kept um, races of honeybees in that lower picture there. Again, on the dead nettle, that's an example of an Italian bee. They're golden in color with dark bands on their abdomens. The German black bee, this is one of the first honeybees brought to North America. Very hardy bees, not perhaps as productive as Italians, but uh, uh, generally very straightforward to manage. And the uh, picture there uh, showing the honeybee foraging on dill is an example of a German black bee. Notice how much darker it is than the Italian bee. Two other races of bees that, are, that are, are widely known and widely kept are the Carniolan and the Caucasian. We have several new races of honeybees and we'll talk about um, integrated pest management here in the moment, but one aspect of integrated pest management is developing honeybee races that have behaviors that make them less susceptible to bee problems. And in the case of, of uh, buckfast bees, and in the case of Minnesota hygienic bees, they actually have behavior patterns that help overcome some of the problems related to uh, varroa mite, which we'll talk about here in, in a bit. So again, Hi. yes. Hi, we have a few questions. Yes. So the first one is from Maggie. She says that she's heard smoking is not wise as it slows down the bees for days. So smoking has to be used carefully, judiciously, and in the right way. It's a mistake to fill a colony full of smoke. When you use smoke, you wanna use it in such a way that first of all, you don't contact the majority of the bees in the hive. You wanna use it, for example, with puffs at the entrance as you begin to work a hive. That way the guard beads at the entrance can then communicate with the rest of the colony that uh, there may be a situation where they're going to have to vacate. And so uh, the, the guard bees and others that, that are near the entrance will begin to consume some honey. It's also useful to disrupt that alarm pheromone that I mentioned earlier. 
And again, by using uh, puffs of smoke at the right place and at the right time, you can do that. Uh, if you're in a situation where you've got uh, general alarm in the colony, uh, quite frankly, it doesn't matter how much smoke you use. You're in a situation where you need to back away, let things calm down before you go back to work with the bees. Smoking is not, uh, not a solution for general alarm in the colony. And, and it's correct, if you oversmoke a colony, it can have adverse effects. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Jennifer. She asks, if there are any scents like lavender, for example, that a beekeeper could wear to help the bees remain calm? That's a good question. I don't know that I have an answer to that. Um, I do know that there are certain scents that you should not wear. You know, for example, there are some perfumes that actually alarm bees and uh, not a good idea to dab those behind your ears or on your, on your temples before working with bees. Uh, there are, I've, I've had the experience personally, there, there are certain aftershaves that bees just don't seem to like. And so in, in that case, uh, you, you wouldn't want to, to use those scents near bees. You know, again, bees are, are, are finely tuned to scents. As I mentioned before, pheromones guide their behavior. And uh, other scents can, can be disruptive or even alarming to, to honeybees. For sure. And then one more question right now. It's from Caleb. Uh, he asks, when do you take fall syrup away when it gets to a certain temperature? Uh, yeah, so um, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on actual hive management tonight. But uh, if you're feeding a colony in the fall, you know, particularly if you're helping the bees develop stores for the winter, uh, you need to start feeding fairly early. You know, don't wait till the last minute. So start feeding while there's, the temperatures are still warm, while there's still lots of bee activity. And then you'll want to discontinue feeding as the temperatures cool, moving into to, uh, October and early November. Great, okay, looks like there's one new message. Okay, this is from Barbara. She says chewing peppermint gum can help calm bees that are buzzing in the face net. Oh, excellent. Thank you for, for the, uh, for the um, uh, information on that. One thing that I've learned early on is that when you get a group of people together who are interested in bees, especially if you've got some experienced beekeepers in the group, there's lots of sharing of information. I appreciate that. For sure. Okay, that's all we have right now. Let's talk just a bit about Italian honeybees. I'm not gonna have enough time this evening to go into each of the races, but uh, we'll talk about uh, honeybees or Italian honeybees. They uh, came to this country from Italy in uh, 1859. Uh, they're beautiful bees, just, just lovely, lovely bees. They're, they're pale yellow to light brown. They have uh, those dark stripes on their abdomen. They're very popular among beekeepers. They have a fast spring buildup. They're less prone to swarming. They're excellent comb producers. And very importantly for beginners, they're docile. They're, they're easy to work with and they're forgiving. Again, for beginners, you know, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to do things that alarm the bees, but Italian honeybees are forgiving. They're docile and they're strong honey producers. Uh, the disadvantage, they do require more winter stores than say more hardy bees, such as, um, such as German blacks. They don't handle cold and damp very well. They're probably better suited. Uh, Missouri is fine, but if we were talking about keeping bees in the Northern parts of uh, North America, there are better strains for those settings. And they do have a strong tendency to rob other colonies. Um, another disadvantage I'll mention is they don't have some of the hygienic behavior that we're seeing in strains like the Minnesota hygienic, which can be so important from the standpoint of managing some of these uh, bee problems such as Varroa mites. We have another question. Yes. Okay, Mikhail says, can painting a hive the wrong color drive a hive to swarm or become aggressive as an example a Holstein hive, a Holstein hive. You know, uh, there, there's a certain amount of, of urban legend about that. It's been my experience that uh, the color of the hive is not really that influential on the behavior of the hive. Typically hives are painted light colors um, because it helps them, them uh, uh, stay cooler during the hot times of the year. But I've seen hives painted many different colors. I have seen Holstein colored hives and I've seen hives that are, are natural colored, you know, the, the, the natural wood color of the hive. So I don't know that there is a, a strong connection between the color of the hive and the behavior of the bees in the hive. I think it's much more a, a, a function of how the bees have been managed and the particular uh, race of bees that you're working with. Very good, we have another question. Um, this is from Jennifer. She asks, um, what species in general are the wild bees that we see here in Southwest Missouri? 
Oh, Jennifer, there are any number of native bees found here in, in Southwest Missouri. Now keep in mind that if you see honeybees and there's no uh, beekeeper or, or honeybee hive in the area, we do have feral bee colonies. And uh, I've been blessed in, in my yard to have a bee tree in my front yard that's been active for about seven years now. So we do have feral colonies of the uh, honeybee found in Missouri. But again, there's many, many species of native, native uh, bee, bees found in, in Missouri. Great, that's all we have right now. Very good. Well, let's talk about uh, getting started now. And um, now we're going to move into more of a discussion of the, the, the mechanics of beekeeping. You know, some, some thoughts on equipment, types of hives, uh, uh, you know, basic things that, that are important to know as you get started with bees. And so we'll start the discussion by, by talking about hive types. So honeybees in nature, you know, if you, if you are blessed with a feral bee colony, you'll, you'll, you can find that they'll make their home in, in lots of different places. What they need basically is a protected cavity. This is my bee tree. It's a uh, silver maple tree that's partially hollow. And about oh, 15 feet up in the air, there's a knot hole. And the bees have been coming into and out of that knot hole for seven years. And it's just fascinating to watch them as they fly in and out. And of course, it's a blessing to have a uh, feral colony in my yard because they provide pollination services for my vegetable garden free of charge. But you can find them not only in hollow trees, but you can find them in abandoned, abandoned buildings. You can find them in the uh, wall cavities of houses. You can find them in uh, caves. You can find them in, in protected areas on rock faces. There are lots of places where you can find honeybee colonies in nature. But when we start to think about managing bees, when we start to think about becoming beekeepers, we're starting to think about hives. And as I mentioned before, the first efforts at keeping bees were bees kept in, in clay jars, in, in pieces of hollow logs, in straw baskets. And again, this can, can be an effective way to keep bees, but when it's time to harvest the honey, you have to destroy the colony. So again, as I mentioned before, the Langstroth hive developed by Reverend Langstroth was, was a revolutionary development. Uh, the greatest advancement in beekeeping, is, you know, it's been described that way. Uh, basically, what uh, Reverend Langstroth did was he measured nests in the wild. And if you've ever come upon a, uh, a uh, feral bee colony in, you know, in a tree where, or, or some setting where you can actually see the comb, you'll notice that the comb is produced in sheets, and there's oftentimes several sheets of comb that are adjacent to each other. And so what Le Reverend Langstroth did was he observed these, these wild colonies, these wild nests, and he measured the distances between these sheets of comb. And he came up with the concept of the bee space. He noticed that there was a fairly uniform distance between these sections of a feral colony. And he called this the bee space. It's about three eighths, inch, three eighths inches or about a centimeter. And he noticed that if there was a wider space than this, then the bees built what's called burr comb that connected these, these main parts of their colony together, the, the nest together. And if it was smaller than 3 8 inch, they filled it up with what's called propolis. And propolis is a, a, uh, a resin, a sticky substance the bees collect from trees. It's basically uh, uh, exudate from tree buds. And I've heard it called bee glue because bees use it in the colony to, to, to stabilize the colony. So again, with small spaces, they fill those spaces with propolis. If the space is wider than 3 8 of an inch, they build burr comb. But if it's right around 3 8 of an inch or, or around a centimeter, then they keep that space open as an area in which to work and travel and, and produce cap cells and, and, and those sorts of things, you know, to support the activity of the hive. So Reverend Langstroth took this concept into a setting where he could place frames into a box and then maintaining that space between the frames, he could then remove these frames. The Langstroth hive is what's called a movable frame design. We can pull it apart, we can pull each frame out, we can look at each frame and inspect it if necessary. And we can recombine the components. We can move frames around. We can divide colonies. Again, a very revolutionary uh, advancement in beekeeping, the development of the Langstroth beehive. Patrick, we have another question. Yes. Caleb asks, what is burr comb? Burr comb is irregular pieces of comb. Uh, frequently, it, it, uh, it doesn't really serve a function other than to hold parts together. You can think about it as a, sort of a bridge between pieces of productive honeycomb. You know, when you think about productive honeycomb, that's the part of the comb 
where bees are raising young bees or where they're storing stores such as pollen or nectar or, or honey. But if you have wide spaces, the bees will stabilize the, the pieces of comb on either side by forming bridges between them. And this is what the burr comb is. It's undesirable in a colony because uh, again, it makes it difficult to pull frames out. In a wild colony, it's necessary because it stabilizes the overall mass of the nest. Do we have any other questions? That's all for now. Okay, let's talk about the modern Langstroth hive. And again, you can see my daughter here working with the Langstroth hive. She's getting ready to put the inner cover on. So there's several parts, and I have a video here in a moment to, to illustrate these parts, but starting from the base and working up, we have the hive stand, and this keeps the hive off the ground. Now, again, in the previous picture, uh, we use concrete blocks to keep the hive off the ground, but oftentimes there's a special box that is built to keep the hive up off the ground. Um, I'll, I'll mention here that uh, when we talk about some of the hazards of beekeeping, one of the things to consider is that as you move hives around, they're up off the ground and as you lift them off a hive stand, you wanna be careful about what might be underneath. There have been cases where there have been skunks or possums or, or copperheads taking shelter under beehives. So be a little cautious when you lift a hive off the hive stand. As far as the, uh, the hive itself, we have the bottom board, which is the base or the foundation of the hive. Then we have the hive body. And this is sometimes called the brood box. Uh, it's a box of some depth, typically nine and a half inches. There can be more than one box that forms the hive body but we'll see more about that here in a moment. Then above the hive body, we have what's called the queen excluder. And the queen excluder is a screen. And this screen actually keeps the queen in the hive body. Remember that the queen is the largest bee in the colony. She's definitely smaller than the worker bees. And the screen that, that forms the queen excluder has a mesh that is large enough to allow worker bees to pass through, but small enough that the queen cannot pass it. Then above the queen excluder, we have honey supers, which is where the bees store the excess honey. On the top of that, we have the inner cover. And then on the top of the inner cover, we have the outer cover. And there's two types of outer covers. One is called the telescoping cover. That's what most of us will be using uh, as, as um, uh, backyard beekeepers or, or hobby beekeepers. It comes down over the sides of the hive. Uh, those large scale beekeepers who are moving hives around, particularly for pollination purposes, have what are called migratory covers. These are flat covers that allow hives to be stacked on top of each other. You know, for example, to load onto a truck to move to a new site. And again, here's a diagram showing the uh, parts of the Langstroth hive. The bee stand, the bottom board, the deep super, the queen excluder, the honey supers, the inner cover, and the outer cover. Now, what's inside the hive? Well, inside the hive, we have frames. In a, in a typical Langstroth hive, we have 10 frames, and we can see this beekeeper holding a frame. The frames are constructed from wood, the framework is, sometimes uh, plastic, there are now plastic frames. And then within the frame is placed the foundation. And the foundation guides the bees in developing the, uh, the uh, uh, comb. And the foundation is placed in the center of the frame and the bees build out in both directions. And it, it uh, we'll see again here in, in, in a moment, there is a pattern on the, uh, the uh, foundation that guides the development of the cells. And the uh, uh, foundation can be made from natural beeswax or it can be a more durable wax coated plastic. Bees build the comb in the frame. The frames are, are uh, designed in such a way that they maintain the bee space when they're adjacent to each other within the, uh, the uh, box, be it a honey super or the uh, brood box. Uh, brood frames used in the brood chamber and honey uh, frames are used in the uh, honey supers. Patrick, we have another question. Yes. Uh, this is from Chris. He asks, um, based on the brief view of, of that image, what stops the queen from leaving if, if you're harvesting honey and remove the screen? So if you're harvesting honey, you typically will leave the queen excluder in place. And remember that the excluder is between the uh, body of the hive and the honey supers. Now, where you have to be cautious, of course, is if you're examining the frames within the brood body, within the uh, hive body because then you're pulling these frames out and it's possible the queen could be on that frame. And so when you're working with bees in, in the, uh, the hive body itself, you always wanna keep the frames over the open top of the hive. That way, if the queen is there and she were to drop off, she would drop down back into the hive. There have been situations where careless beekeepers have taken a frame out, 
not realize the queen was there. She's fallen off into the grass and been lost. So again, very important to, to uh, uh, be careful when you're pulling frames out of the, the, uh, the hive body itself. You can oftentimes tell if the queen is there, obviously she's the largest bee, but frequently you'll see worker bees, the nurse bees clustered around her. So if you pull that out, and, and there may be some cases where we're actually seeking the queen. Now, in, in uh, cases where queens have been introduced into hives, frequently they're marked. We'll see a little bit later on uh, a marked queen, but um, the uh, uh, marked queen has a little dot on her thorax and helps you identify which bee in the colony is the queen. Great, thank you. That's all we have right now. Excellent. Now there are other hive designs. First of all, the top bar hive. Uh, sometimes these are called coffin hives for, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, rather than being a vertical hive like the Langstroth hive where you, you stack components higher and higher, this is a horizontal hive where the bees are forced to work in a, in a horizontal fashion. And bees typically don't work this way in nature. And uh, so it's somewhat contrary to their normal behavior patterns. Uh, it's cheap and easy to build. There's no standard size. And there is a bar suspended inside under the, uh, the uh, top of the bar hive. And the bees just build comb suspended from this top bar. There's no frames, for example, for support. Now, obviously it's more difficult to examine this colony. And when it comes time to harvest the honey, frequently this is done by just drawing the comb out and crushing the comb to, to uh, uh, draw forth the honey. Top bar hives are more difficult to manage, uh, less straightforward than a Langstroth hive and typically are, are, are not the best way for beginning beekeepers, but for those who are more advanced and wanna try it out, uh, yeah, it can, be, it can be an interesting experience to work with top bar hives. The horizontal hive is somewhat like a, a uh, uh, top bar hive and it's somewhat like a Langstroth hive. It's actually a, a hive that is a Langstroth hive from the standpoint of having movable frames but it's a much longer hive. It holds many more than, than the typical nine to 10 frames found in a standard Langstroth hive. So in this case, bees have to work both, both horizontally, again, which is, is um, somewhat contrary to, uh, to their, their normal tendencies. We use Langstroth frames in, in horizontal hives. And again, it's not standard and typically not a good design for new beekeepers to start with. Then there's the war hive, which is a combination of a Langstroth and the top bar. It's a vertical hive, uh, but it uses top bars within each box rather than frames. And again, with, with this approach, it's more difficult to manage. It's much more difficult to examine the colony, and it's more difficult to uh, extract the, uh, the honey. And quite frankly, war hives are used most frequently in situations where the person managing that hive is more interested in the bees themselves than in the honey that might be developed by the colony. In other words, if uh, the goal was to develop uh, a strong colony for pollination purposes, this would be one way to do it. We have another question. Yes. Uh, Amanda says, I've heard that horizontal hives are useful for breeding colonies. Is that true? Yes, we're not going to get into, uh, into, uh, into great detail as far as, as making splits or making nukes, but uh, using horizontal hives can be a good way to develop lots of frames that are suitable for breaking apart into smaller colonies to establish new hives. Yes, that's certainly true. Very good. That's all we have right now. And then the most recently developed uh, hive design is the flow hive. And I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about flow hives. I've not worked with them myself. I've read a bit about their design. Um, with this type of a setting, you have a special type of uh, foundation and a special type of frame within the hive. And it's a type where the honey, as it's produced, actually percolates through the frame and collects in an area where you can draw it off without actually pulling out the frames and extracting the honey. Uh, there's some question about the durability of these hives. There's some question about whether or not bees are, are uh, uh, as, as productive, you know, the, in, in this sort of a setting, but particularly from a, uh, a, a hobby standpoint, it might be interesting to try a flow hive. Bees produce lots of propolis in, in uh, response to flow hives, and this has to be recognized. It can make it a challenge to break the hive down and examine it. Okay, do we have any other questions before we move on to, to uh, equipment? No other questions right now. Okay, now let's talk a bit about beekeeping equipment. 
So what do you need to get started about with in, in beekeeping? Well, your basic needs, of course, are, are the hive. And we talked about the parts of a Langstroth hive, and it's certainly recommended that new beekeepers start with a Langstroth hive. You need some basic tools. What do you need? Well, quite frankly, a hive tool is helpful. Uh, a bee brush is helpful and a smoker is helpful. Protective equipment. You know, again, sooner or later, you're going to get stung, but you want to try to develop uh, a, a working environment where that, that eventuality is minimized. So wearing protective equipment can be very helpful. So a bee suit, gloves, and a veil. And then, of course, you need the bees. Okay, we'll talk about uh, uh, that here more in a moment. If you grow to the, the uh, size where you're, you're going to be extracting honey, uh, you can certainly extract honey by just crushing the combs and collecting the honey. But it's much more efficient to actually collect the uh, honey through extraction. And to do this, an uncapping knife where you scrape the caps off of the, uh, the uh, comb that has the honey sealed within the cells is, is needed. And then an extractor to spin the frames and throw the honey out of the cells into the extractor. Now, Uncapping knives and extractors are, are costly and there's a bit of skill required to use them effectively. It's been my experience that uh, it's a good situation for a hobby beekeeper to develop a relationship with a commercial beekeeper that has this equipment and that will allow them to, to uh, come in and use their equipment to, to uncap frames and to spin the honey out. Now, what about used equipment? You know, certainly used tools, used uh, protective equipment is fine, but be very cautious about used hives, used frames, uh, other wooden parts of, of, of um, the equipment because uh, used equipment frequently is available because something happened to the colony that was in that hive. You know, it, it died for whatever reason. And there can be situations where the, uh, the colony may have died as a result of a disease. And some diseases actually produce resting stages that are very durable, that are very hard to clean off of woodenware. And if you try to establish a new colony in this used equipment, you can actually have problems with uh, with diseases and from that point on. All right, we have another question. Yes. Lori asks, how many brooder boxes do you need when you start a hive? A hive can be started with one brood box, but typically as the season progresses and the uh, strength of the colony builds, you'll need two boxes to adequately house the, uh, the 60,000 plus worker bees and the queen. And then again, those, those drone hangers on. So it's a good practice to consider using two uh, deep boxes, two, two uh, uh, brood boxes to comprise the main part of the hive. Great, that's it for now. Okay, let's watch some videos that uh, uh, describe some of the equipment and uh, tools and protective clothing that are, are helpful in getting started with bees. Okay, Anna, can we see the video? We can see it. Okay, excellent. I'm Patrick Byers, horticulture field specialist with University of Missouri Extension. Let's talk about getting started in beekeeping. This is an example of a Langstroth hive, which is the most commonly used type of hive for beekeeping in the United States. Let's take a look at the components of a Langstroth hive. The first thing we have is, is the cover. This is sometimes called a telescoping cover because the sides telescope over the sides of the hive. Frequently, it will have a metal top to it. And then, of course, it's made out of wood. The next thing that we frequently see in a Langstroth hive is an inner cover. And this is the inner cover that is placed over the top of the supers. It gives the bees an area to congregate on top of the hive. And then we move into the body of the hive itself. This box on top is called a super. Now there are supers of different depths. This is a shallow super. A little bit further down, we'll talk about deep supers. Within the super are the frames and the frames of course are the part of the uh, hive where the bees build out the comb and store the honey. So here is our shallow super. And again, this is where the honey will be stored. 
within the super are the frames. The frames comprise the inner part of a beehive, whether it be a hive body or, or a honey super. Let's take a look at a frame and, and talk about the different parts. So typically a frame is built out of wood. There are plastic frames that are available now. The top part is the top bar, the bottom bar, and the side bars. Now within the frame is placed foundation. In this case, it's a durable plastic foundation, but you can also use foundation that is made from rolled sheets of beeswax. The foundation provides a guide for the worker bees to draw out the honeycomb. The foundation is placed inside of the frame. There's a little slot along the bottom bar. Then at the top, there is a detachable piece that is pressed against the, the uh, foundation and then nailed or stapled into place. Typically, there are nine or 10 frames in, uh, in each super. Now, this is the part of the hive where the, the uh, worker bees will store honey. We don't want the queen up in this part of the hive laying eggs. So there frequently is a piece of equipment called a queen excluder. And the queen excluder is a mesh, stainless steel mesh, with just enough space to allow worker bees to pass through. But the queen, of course, which is a, the largest bee in the colony, she's a little bit too large to pass through the screen. So this effectively keeps her in the lower part of the hive. This is the main part of the beehive. So these deep boxes are sometimes called deep supers, sometimes they're called brood boxes, or sometimes they're called hive bodies. But this is where the action takes place in a beehive. Within the, uh, the brood boxes, the queen is active. Uh, the worker bees will draw out the comb, forming the cells. The queen will lay an egg in the cell. The worker bees will provision the cell and then care for the brood until it becomes an adult bee. All of that takes place here in the, uh, the lower part of the hive. Frequently, there are two of these uh, deep supers that are used to comprise the body of the hive. As was the case with the honey super, within the uh, deep super, we have frames, again, nine or 10 frames, and the worker bees will draw out the comb on those frames. A beekeeper will frequently provide two deep bodies or, or two uh, hive bodies for the colony. And this is because the queen tends to work upwards as she's laying eggs and uh, uh, maintaining the colony. And the beekeeper can then switch these out uh, top to bottom as needed during the season. Here we have two examples of hive bases. The uh, more modern type, as we see here, has a screen on. And this screen allows for uh, uh, varroa mites and other problems to drop out of the hive as the bees groom themselves. Uh, this particular one has an open bottom. This one here allows for the placement of a uh, bottom board that might have a, a sticky substance on to help trap things such as small hive beetles and varroa mites. Let's talk about the entrance to the beehive. Now, uh, there are some designs of bottom boards that allow for a sloping landing surface for the honeybees, and that's very helpful. As the worker bees are leaving the colony or arriving back with stores, it's nice to give them an area that they can land on to easily access the hive. Other designs just have a, a smooth landing surface here, but it is important to provide an area for the bees to land. There may be times during the uh, season where you want to reduce the size of the entrance to the hive. And that's done with a uh, entrance reducer, as we see here. This has slots of different sizes, depending on how much access you want to allow into the colony. And it's placed over the hive opening and then slid into place. You can see now that we've reduced the size of the opening to the small area here. This might be done in the winter time to, uh, to uh, uh, allow the hive to, to stay warmer, to allow less cold air into the hive or it may be used with a weak hive to help reduce the area that the bees have to defend against uh, neighboring colonies that would be interested in robbing the colony. Let's talk about bee space. The Langstroth hive was revolutionary in that Lorenzo Langstroth recognized that if the components of a hive were placed the right distance apart, the bees would not build bridge comb or, or other types of comb that would interfere with pulling pieces out. And that space is about a centimeter. And we can see here between the frames in this hive, there's about a centimeter in space and the bees will draw out the comb in the frames, but they won't connect the frames to each other. So the beekeeper can pull out individual frames and examine the hive. The space between components, between uh, the uh, supers is also about a centimeter. 
And again, that allows the, that right amount of space for the bees to work and they won't bridge across it from super to super so that you can pull entire supers off of a hive if desired. There will be times when honeybees may need to be fed and there are different designs as far as feeders for honeybees, lots of different techniques. Here's an example of a, uh, a way to feed honeybees that's a homemade version. The uh, sugar syrup is placed into a glass jar and then the jar has a series of holes punched in the lid and then it will slowly come out through those holes and the bees can then feed on that syrup. Uh, the way that this one works is that we remove the telescoping cover from the hive, we remove the inner cover from the hive, we place this on where the inner cover was and then we'll place a shallow super around it and then we'll replace the telescoping cover on top. This way it's easy to access the, uh, the uh, jars to replenish the uh, syrup as needed. So let's review the parts of a Langstroth hive. First we start with the base, the uh, landing board. Then we have the hive body or the brood boxes. On top of the brood boxes, a queen excluder. And then on top of the queen excluder, we have the honey supers. On top of the honey supers will be an inner cover. And then crowning it all will be the telescoping cover. The parts of a Langstroth beehive. Okay, do we have any questions on the parts of a Langstroth hive? Um, we do have some questions that popped up during that video. The first yes. one is from Anonymous, who asks, what is it like to care for bees during the winter? Well, as far as caring for bees during the winter, the, 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 the first thing is to make sure you go into the fall and winter with a strong colony. And uh, the uh, uh, ways that you do that, of course, are, are through management. But it's also important to, uh, to uh, make sure that uh, you've allowed sufficient stores there. You know, if, if, you're, if you're taking honey for, for your own use, that's fine, but make sure that you leave enough to support the activity of the colony. It's also important to find a sheltered area in which to, to overwinter the colonies. Uh, if much further north than, than Missouri, uh, beekeepers will actually wrap insulated blankets around their colonies to help keep them warm. You know, basically the bees survive by forming a mass within the colony and by shivering, quite frankly. And there's a small release of heat as they shiver that helps maintain the warmth of the mass of bees. Um, you know, the colonies can be lost during the winter. That's certainly true. It's a stressful time for a colony, but if the colony is in good health and it's a strong colony and it has sufficient stores moving into the winter, you should be able to overwinter it. Great, we have another question from Michelle who asks, would some areas be considered too warm to use wax foundations? Uh, so when we think about um, wax foundation, uh, you know, sooner or later, we're going to have to have a situation where we can, we can uh, have the wax that we need. I mean, um, the uh, whole goal of, uh, of, a, of a, a bee colony is again to, to develop the comb to, to have the stores and to support activity as far as the laying of eggs and the development of young bees. And to do that, again, wax does melt, right? And so honeybees uh, spend a good deal of their time during the warmer parts of the year keeping the hive cool. And they do this in several ways. They do this, first of all, by vibrating their wings and generating air currents within the colony. They also do it by, uh, by evaporative cooling. And, uh, you know, as, as uh, Nectar is brought into the hive, it has a fairly high water content, but as it dries, again, it releases uh, moisture and then the bees move that around and that helps cool the hive as well. 
Of course, it's important to place the hive in an area where there's good air movement, good airflow around it for keep it from getting too hot. But you know, there have been cases where, where it's gotten just so hot and particularly if something has happened to block the entrance of a hive, we've had situations where it's gotten warm enough inside the hive that wax has begun to sag and melt. And again, that can be quite damaging from the standpoint of, of the uh, uh, survival of the colony. All right, Roger asks um, if he heard correctly that we should not put out sugar water on warm winter days like this Saturday. You know, that's, that's a, a good question. And uh, you'll, you'll find differing, differing opinions when it comes to the advisability of feeding bees during the winter. Um, I'm of the camp where, again, if the colony is going into the, the winter in good health and there are sufficient stores to support the colony, I don't feel that I need to feed that colony over the winter. If it's a weaker colony, you know, if there's some issue there, then perhaps there would be some benefit in, uh, in feeding the colony. And this would be feeding it using uh, uh, oh, sugar or uh, fondant rather than a, a uh, sugar syrup. Um, David asks, how stable are those sections of the beehive in strong winds? Well, from the standpoint of stability, you definitely want to put a weight on top of each colony to help hold things in place. Uh, I've seen situations, particularly as, uh, as you're stacking honey supers on it, it may be a situation where you have two deep bodies for them, the main body of the hive, and you might have three or four honey supers stacked up. And in that setting, things can get a bit top heavy. So it's important to have a good strong base. It's important to have something holding it in place. But I've seen situations where beekeepers have actually stapled supers together using long staples, or they've put um, uh, come alongs or straps around the uh, hive to hold all the components together. And particularly in areas where <laughs> there might be something disruptive like bears, it can be helpful to, to stabilize your colonies. For sure. Um, another question, Lori asks, you only harvest just from the honey box only. Um, when do you switch the trays out from the brooder boxes? So yes, you harvest from the honey supers. Your goal is to separate the, uh, the uh, uh, reproductive activity of the hive from the excess stores. Now keep in mind that the, the honeybees will store both honey and pollen down in the brood boxes, and that's there to support the, uh, the development of the, uh, the larval honeybees. But in a, in a strong hive, the bees will store excess stores, and that's stored again up in the honey supers. And so again, in, in a judicious way, a beekeeper can draw some of that off for, for uh, human use. You don't wanna take too much, you don't wanna leave too much on the colony, but from the standpoint of, of efficient management, it's much easier to draw off honey supers that have nothing but honey in them, while the uh, uh, reproductive aspects are, are uh, maintained down in the brood box. Now, as far as, as switching things around, uh, as you examine the colony, if you start to notice that most of the queen's activity is in the upper box and that you have frames in the lower box that have open cells, that's the point where you wanna switch the, the upper box, the upper, upper hive box with the lower box to give the queen an area to work in. As I mentioned before, queens tend to work upwards. And if you leave a situation where uh, you don't move the, the uh, the uh, two hive bodies around, the queen will eventually get to the top. She'll come up against the uh, hive, the uh, queen excluder, and that can can lead her to, uh, you know, she's not going to be as effective in laying eggs and generating new bees. So one of the benefits of having two deep bodies is that you can switch them around as the queen moves from one into the other. For sure. And then Chris asks, basic follow-ups. How often should you look at harvesting honey during the normal season? and during winter to maximize their food, is there a general rule of thumb for harvesting versus leaving? Well, the, the second question first, the general rule of thumb is you wanna leave at least uh, one honey, full honey super on the colony. Uh, some beekeepers will actually judge by the weight of honey that they've left, but at least one and, and two would be even better. Um, as far as when you can harvest the honey, you can harvest the honey any time that it's been packed into cells that have been capped. And Beekeepers will frequently harvest honey around what are called honey flows. And honey flows are basically periods of time when um, uh, there's an abundant supply of nectar and bees are collecting a lot of nectar and uh, developing a lot of honey. Frequently here in Missouri, there's a spring honey flow and a fall honey flow. So beekeepers may be extracting both in the, in the spring as a result of that honey flow and then in the fall. 
Okay, and then Michelle asks, is NUC and UC short for something? It is indeed, and we'll be covering that here in a moment, but it's short for, for uh, nuclear hive. We'll see one of those here in just a moment. Okay, good to know. And those are all the questions we have right now. Okay, excellent discussion. Keep the questions coming. Uh, let's take a look at another video here. Okay, Hannah, can we see this? Uh, at the moment, it's just a dark screen. You can see it. Okay. I'm Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension. Let's talk about getting started in beekeeping. A beekeeper will need several basic tools. The first, of course, is a hive tool. Uh, the hive tool is useful for prying parts of the hive apart. It's also useful for prying out frames for examination. Uh, it's useful for scraping burr comb and, and other parts of the, the, uh, the uh, uh, wax that you might want to remove from the hive. The second piece of equipment is a bee brush. The bee brush has soft nylon bristles. It's useful for brushing bees off of an inner cover, brushing bees off of frames before examination. Opening a hive for examination is a disruptive process, and it's natural that the bees will assume a defensive behavior pattern. This is where the smoker comes in. The judicious use of smoke placed at the right place and at the right time will help disarm this natural defensive behavior of the honeybee. For example, the smoke disrupts the pheromones that honeybees produce when they're alarmed. The smoke also convinces the honeybees that there may be the risk that the colony is on fire. And as part of the uh, defensive mechanisms, they will begin to consume honey. And a bee that has consumed honey becomes more docile and easier to work with. So let's fire up our smoker. I prefer to use burlap to get things going and then pine needles to provide a good, cool, dense smoke. So let's get it lit here. Right. Now we'll go ahead and put some pine needles in. I collect pine needles in the fall when my white pines drop their needles so that I have a good supply. Again, look at the, the good quality smoke that this is producing. Now we're ready to, to work with our bees. So you want to use smoke judiciously. You don't want to use too much and you don't want to use it at the wrong time. But initially, when you begin working with the hive, it could be helpful to throw a few puffs across the entrance. And then as you open up the inner cover, throw a few puffs across there as well. Then wait. The bees again will become more docile after they consume honey. And then you can start working with your colony. Now keep the smoker handy because there may be times where you need to apply a bit more smoke if the bees become belligerent. So bees will sting, and it's important that the beekeeper protect themselves from bee stings. It's been my experience that bees will find every chink in your armor, so you wanna think carefully about how you're gonna protect yourself from your feet, to the tips of your fingers, to the top of your head, your entire body. Let's talk first about gloves. Uh, a good pair of bee gloves is the right size. You don't want them too large or too small because that would affect your dexterity. Bee gloves frequently are gauntlet length, as we see here, to protect not just your hands, but your arm as well. And there's elastic at the cuff to hold it tight against your arm. Here's an example of a bee veil. The bee veil allows you to work with the bees to have clear vision, but still protect yourself from the bees. Typically, there's a, a ventilated hat that's worn, and then again, the veil itself is made out of nylon and metal screen. Now to protect your body from these things, you could certainly wear a heavy shirt and pants and, and perhaps boots and, and, and other articles of clothing, but to make the job comfortable and quite frankly, to give yourself better protection, it's a good practice to use a bee suit. 
And here's an example of a bee suit. Uh, typically, these bee suits are light in color because it's a, a cooler job wearing them when you're working bees, especially during the heat of the summer. And in the case of this suit, the veil is actually integral with the suit. And we can see that right here. So let me demonstrate the uh, beekeeping equipment. So we'll slip on our coveralls. And then we'll put on the veil. And zip them up. And the final step is to zip up your bale. Okay, and then we'll put on the gloves. And again, these typically will go on the outside of your the uh, cuffs of your uh, coveralls. Okay, do we have any questions, Anna? No questions right now. Okay, very good. Well, let me go ahead and share back the screen here. Okay, can we see the presentation? We can see it. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, I'll make a... I'll make a couple of additional comments on uh, what we just saw in the video. Uh, first of all, the fuel for your smoker. Uh, you certainly want to avoid uh, any treated wood. You want to avoid any petroleum-based uh, materials like synthetic fabrics or uh, uh, you know, anything that would be oil-soaked in the smoker because it'll produce fumes that could, will injure the bees. And you also want to avoid uh, uh, fuel that would generate too hot of a fire. You don't want to turn your smoker into a flamethrower because that certainly will, will injure bees as well. Um, and then uh, from the standpoint of the, uh, the color of your coveralls, I, I favor white because it is cooler to wear white coveralls in the heat of the summer. But I've also been told that if you wear dark coveralls, there's some sort of primordial response of the bees to a large dark object as they would to a bear. And, and uh, it can be more difficult to work bees in dark colored uh, clothing. So be a bit cautious about that. Now, how much does it cost to get started in beekeeping? Well, you know, it, it, it all depends, right? And if you're a, a carpenter and you have some raw materials on hand, you can certainly build the wooden parts of a, of a beehive. You could build the telescoping cover, you could build the inner, inner cover, you could build the uh, supers. Uh, it's best to buy the frames so that you can buy them broken down and put them together. But uh, many of the components you can you can build yourself. Uh, accessory equipment you could certainly purchase uh, used uh, bee brush, used uh, hive tool, used clothing. Um, as I mentioned, buying used woodenware is always risky, so be cautious about that. But here are some rough thoughts on what it might cost to get started in beekeeping. Well, the bees uh, it could be free if you can capture a swarm, or up to three hundred and fifty dollars if you buy a, a complete hive. The hive itself, one hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars. Uh, accessory equipment, your bee suit, your gloves, your veil, uh, your tools, that's going to be somewhere between $100 to $300. And then hive treatment. We'll talk about varroa here, but you need to plan on managing uh, some of the problems that can strike bees, and that includes varroa mite. And hive treatment anywhere from $20 to $200. So again, as I mentioned in the, the uh, second slide, 
of the uh, our our time together, uh, there is a cost to to getting started in beekeeping. Now, where are you going to get your honeybees from? Uh, this is a cool picture. This was several years ago when I had the opportunity to capture a swarm that was up in a tree and climbed up on my truck, put a, a pile of boxes there, put a, a, a hive body on top of that and shook them down into it and was just absolutely thrilled to get a new colony of bees. But uh, let's talk about where we can obtain honeybees. Well, we can certainly purchase a complete hive. Um, Occasionally, a, an established beekeeper will, will, will sell a complete hive, and typically it's going to be one deep body, the 10 frames, and then uh, obviously the, uh, the bees and the queen within. And so this can be one way to, to uh, get started in, in beekeeping. A more common way is to purchase what's called a split. And beekeepers will frequently divide colonies in the spring. Uh, it has to be done at the right time. It has to be done as the bee numbers have built because you're essentially taking one colony and breaking it into two parts and there have to be enough bees present to support both of the new colonies. Now, I mentioned earlier, there's only one queen per hive. What does this mean? Well, one queen will stay behind in, in uh, the, you know, one half of the split. The other part of the split has to include uh, frames that have eggs and young enough brood on that the worker bees can actually, by feeding these, these uh, uh, young brood or the, the uh, larvae that hatch out of the eggs that are present, they can actually direct their growth into new queens. And they can do this by, by uh, uh, changing the food that they feed the, uh, the uh, developing larva. The uh, developing larvae are, are, are fed something called royal jelly, where, uh, whereas uh, worker bee brood are fed pollen. And so when the split is made, if there are some, some frames that have young enough brood or eggs in, the worker bees can sense there's no longer a queen in this new colony. They'll generate a new queen and then uh, the uh, colony will move ahead from that point. Obviously there can be some failures in doing this and it's important to recognize that as well, but you can certainly purchase a split. Hey, we have now, a the couple questions. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Uh, Lori asks, how can you find a reputable bee seller? Is there anything to be aware of when searching for, for a bee seller? My advice in finding a reputable bee seller is to work with beekeeping associations. Here in Missouri, we're blessed with the Missouri State Beekeepers Association, and we're doubly blessed in Southwest Missouri to have the uh, Southwest Missouri Beekeeping Association. And they're both uh, uh, organizations that are based upon reputable beekeepers. So check their membership lists. Um, oftentimes they will have uh, uh, bulletin boards where they, they can offer services such as uh, swarm capture, and also uh, equipment for sale and uh, uh, bee colony splits, or as we'll see here, nukes or, uh, or other, other ways of starting with bees as well. So again, it's, it's good to work with a local beekeeper who, who is again, reputable. And you can find out who those folks are by the membership in the various organizations. For sure, and then one more question right now. Angie asks um, that they're wanting to plant white clover as cover crop for their vegetable garden. Um, will that attract honeybees? And if so, do they need to provide a hive for them? White clover is an excellent forage plant for, for honeybees. Uh, you don't need to provide a colony. Uh, if there are feral bees in the neighborhood, they will find it. But if you do uh, uh, decide that you want to become a beekeeper and you establish a colony, you'll find that they will be foraging on that, that white clover. Okay, and then another question, James says, uh, that they own an SUV. If they purchase a nuke, how can they transport it? Uh, if they purchase a nuke and you want to transport it. Um, well, let's talk about nukes here at the moment. And uh, a common way to, to get started in honeybees is to buy a nuke. And a nuke is sort of like a miniature hive. And whereas a, a, um, a standard size uh, super in a Langstroth hive has typically 10 frames, a nuke typically has five. And we can see in this picture an example of a nuke. And um, the uh, nuke is uh, a convenient way, obviously, to, to take a hive and break it into pieces and provide a queen with each of the, uh, the uh, nukes and then to, to sell that to establish new colonies. Now, if you wanted to move a nuke, it would be the same process as if you were moving a hive. Um, keep in mind that, that if you shut up a nuke or a hive, you just have a limited window of time before you have to reopen it. So, you know, for example, if you wanted to move it across country, it can certainly be done but you'll have to keep it cool. And rather than putting a solid uh, bar or something like that across the entrance, you wanna put a screen across the entrance so that there can be air movement into and out of the hive. 
And the same thing, if you look at this uh, picture here, you'll notice down there, there is that rotating wheel on that new hive. And the beekeeper has it open so that bees can freely access the hive at this current setting. But you can see there's a slotted setting on that wheel. And uh, the beekeeper can turn it down to that slotted setting. And the openings now are too small for bees to move into and out of. And so when he's interested in moving that particular nuke, he rotates that wheel. The bees are confined inside the hive, but there's still good air movement into the hive to, to keep the hive from smothering. All right, and then another question, well, statement. Jessica says there's also an Ozark Beekeepers Association um, where they brought uh, their bees from a man who ended up being a mentor and a dear friend. Ah, yes. Uh, the, uh, and, and I think I misspoke. I think I meant to say the Ozarks Beekeepers Association. Uh, again, it's, it's a fabulous group. In more normal times, they offer a spring uh, beginning beekeeping series of classes, which is absolutely excellent. My daughter went through that several years ago. Uh, during the COVID area, I think they've suspended the classes, but hopefully, hopefully, once we move beyond COVID, those classes will resume because they've been just instrumental in developing beekeeping here in Southwest Missouri. So check out their website. And Jessica also says that they're doing classes on Zoom. Oh, wonderful. I didn't realize that. Fabulous. Excellent. And that looks like that's all the questions for now. An excellent way to, to start a new colony of bees is with a nucleus hive, and, and that's abbreviated as a nuke hive. And as I said before, it, it typically is made up of five frames and the bees that are attached to it, and then a queen is provided into the nuke hive. And then this can be then transported easily, and then the entire nuke can be more or less emptied into a full-sized Langstroth body to, to start a new colony. Another way to obtain honeybees is to buy what's called a bee package. And here we can see an example of a bee package. It's basically a screened box. And within that box, there's a number of bees, usually somewhere around uh, three pounds or so of worker bees. And then uh, suspended in the middle of that box is a can that contains sugar syrup. And again, that provides a, a food stock to, to keep the bees uh, active and, and healthy on the trip. And then within the box is also a smaller box that contains the queen. And you'll notice there in the lower picture, there is the, uh, the queen's box. And again, she has a, a little bit of, of uh, sugar candy to keep her happy. And the worker bees can, can keep her fed and watered through the screen. Now, in this sort of a setting, the uh, worker bees and the queen often are not from the same hive. Frequently what happens is a beekeeper will take a very strong colony, shake about uh, three pounds of bees into the box, and then place a different queen in the box with them. And then in the course of transporting the uh, package to the uh, new home, they all become friends and, and become, you know, uh, the, the queen pheromones then become, begin to direct the activity of the uh, worker bees in the package. The package is put into a cardboard box and it can be then shipped through the mail. And it's always exciting to open up that package and bring out or open up the box and bring out the package of bees and, and install them into a, uh, into a uh, hive body. And then the, uh, the uh, fourth way to uh, start a new colony is to catch a swarm. And uh, catching swarms is so exciting. It's just, just from a beekeeper's standpoint, it doesn't get more exciting than catching a swarm. Uh, from the standpoint of the public, a swarm can be quite alarming. But if uh, managed properly, uh, there's very little risk to getting skin stinged in catching swarms. But again, it's, it's probably not something that is, is for a new, uh, uh, a new person in beekeeping or a novice. It's best to work with an experienced beekeeper to, to learn the techniques and, and see how it's done. Um, there are some, well, let's go ahead and watch a video here that I have of, of uh, swarm catching. And forgive me, but this will take just a moment to, uh, to, uh, uh, bring up the uh, video.
Okay, Anna, can we see the uh, video? We can see it. Okay. I'm Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension. Let's talk about capturing a bee swarm. Well, if you've ever come across a swarm of bees, thousands of bees clustered together in a buzzing, pulsing mass, it can be an interesting experience. Realize that most of the time bee society takes place within the dark confines of a hive, but now all of a sudden, the bees have sought a new home and they're out in the open. Bees typically swarm in the spring or the early summer, and a swarm is an exciting event for a beekeeper. It's an excellent way to acquire the uh, start of a new colony of bees. Within the swarm is the, the queen, and then a number of worker bees that have left with her. Typically a hive or a feral colony will swarm when the population begins to grow early in the season. And then as the uh, bees and the queen leave the hive, typically they'll settle down within, oh, 100 feet or so of the hive, and then they'll regroup. And then scout bees will fly out from the swarm looking for a new home. Well, again, this is an excellent opportunity for, uh, for capturing the start of a new colony. Now, swarms will typically land on a tree or a shrub. Usually they're about chest or head high, but sometimes they land high in a tree. Sometimes they land on the eave of a house or, or a building or, or someplace where it's difficult to reach them. So there may be some situations which is just not practical to try to capture the swarm. However, if it is accessible, it's definitely worth putting some effort into capturing it. Now, capturing a swarm is not something for a novice uh, or, or a first time uh, beekeeper to attempt. There is some risk from the standpoint of, of, of stinging, and it's important to protect yourself adequately while you're doing the job. Oftentimes, uh, local beekeeping groups or, or an experienced beekeeper will place their number on call so the public can contact them when a swarm is sighted. And again, as I mentioned earlier, capturing a swarm is a wonderful thing from the standpoint of a beekeeper. Well, here's the process. Okay, once the swarm has been located, the first step is to find a suitable container to hold the swarm. Now this could be an empty beehive, this is frequently done, or it could be a cardboard box or, or perhaps a plastic tote or some sort of large size container. The key is that it have a lid, that it can, can obviously confine the bees and that it's ventilated, okay? If you've got to improvise on short notice, make sure that you have some ventilation in the uh, container so that once you've captured the swarm, they don't smother, especially on a hot day. Secondly, Suit up, protect yourself. You do need a bee suit in case the bees get agitated. It's also helpful to have a bee brush. The a bee brush can help brush the bees off of whatever the swarm has lit on into your container. Okay, now, uh, sometimes you can actually cut the support if it's a small tree or something like that and bring that along with you. But in other cases, you may need to actually dislodge the bees from the, uh, the uh, area where they lit. Um, it can be helpful to spray the outside of the swarm with a sugar syrup. This will again will help uh, uh, keep the bees within the mass of the swarm. It will help keep them from flying when you begin to do the process of dislodging the, uh, the swarm. Now, after you've dislodged the bees, make sure that they end up in your container. Be it a hive, if it's a hive, place it close underneath the swarm so that the bees end up in it. If it's a container or a box, try to place it so the swarm is enclosed when you dislodge the bees. But again, the goal is to capture as many of the bees as possible within your container. Uh, the next step is to uh, take a, 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 a look, stand back and observe and see what's happening once you have the bees within the container. Typically, the queen is in the mass of the bees and she'll end up in the container or in the, uh, the hive. If, however, she hasn't, then the bees will begin to, to to become agitated, they'll, they'll try to climb out of the box, they'll try to move back to the location of the queen. And if this is the case, by all means, let them loose, uh, let them regather, and then you'll likely have another chance to, to uh, repeat the process. Uh, if you have the opportunity, wait for stragglers. Uh, leave your box in place or your, your container uh, for a period of time because there will be some bees that will be flying and the scout bees, of course, will be out as well. And it can be helpful to allow them to return to the area where you've, you've uh, done the, uh, the swarm capture. And then finally, set up the new hive. <clears throat> it's always a good idea to have a hive 
uh, ready to go with, with foundation and frames uh, ready to go uh, because you never know when you'll have the opportunity to capture a swarm. At any rate, have that hive ready and then transfer the bees into the new hive within 24 hours of capturing them. In fact, within, within as short a period of time as possible from capturing the swarm. And then with a little luck, they'll settle down and you'll have a new colony. We brought the uh, swarm home inside of our can. We made sure that we kept it cool and certainly out of the sun, it would be very, very easy for the uh, swarm to get too warm in here and for the bees to suffocate. So now we're ready to place them into the hive. We have a hive that we previously prepared. It has a uh, foundation in place and hopefully the bees will find this an attractive home and will settle in very quickly. We'll remove some frames from the center so that we have room in which to place the swarm. It's been several days since we captured the swarm and attempted to install it in this beehive. Judging by the activity, the bees seem to have adopted this as their new home. We placed a reducing bar at the hive entrance to give them just a small area to go into and out of. We've also been feeding the bees with sugar syrup. We've not opened the hive to see how things are going inside. We'll do that here in several days. But based upon the activity, the bees seem to have adopted this as their new home and we've successfully installed this swarm. Okay, do we have any questions about catching a swarm? No question. Oh, one question. Should the queen be located when gathering a swarm? Well, it's been my experience that it can be very difficult to find the queen in the swarm. Uh, the bees are all, again, congregated around within the mass. And again, it's been my experience that as long as they're congregated in this mass, it's, it's a very strong... Um, uh, likelihood that the queen is within that mass. I've seen situations where I've been trying to catch a swarm and, and I caught part of it and, and I didn't have the queen and, and all of a sudden I see another small mass of bees gathering on another shrub and then all of a sudden all the bees I had in my box just took flight and flew over to that other shrub. They, the pheromones that are released are just irresistible to the bees and they will congregate wherever the queen is. So oftentimes the behavior of the bees will tell you whether or not you've been successful in catching the queen, but she will be within the mass. And generally, if you handle it carefully and do a good job of getting the uh, swarm into a container, you'll, you'll catch the queen. Okay. And then Bob asks, can bees from the wild be enticed into a new hive box? And if so, how? Can bees in the wild be enticed into a new hive box? Um, so what I commonly see beekeepers doing is placing what are called um, swarm catchers or uh, uh, swarm boxes just at places around their property. And these are, are uh, oftentimes they're, they're a shallow super. Sometimes there's other designs to them, but they're shallow super with the bottom with, with foundation in and with the top on that they place up in a tree. And these are, are again, uh, uh, sites that uh, scout bees will locate when a colony is swarmed and draw the, the uh, swarm to the uh, the uh, uh, swarm catcher. And then the beekeeper, once the bees are in there, can take it down and establish a new colony. If you have an existing colony, say in a, in a bee tree or in a, uh, the, the wall cavity of a house, it can be a real challenge to effectively move that into a, a managed setting. Uh, again, it, it's just difficult because it's first of all, hard to move the irregular comb that forms in those sorts of situations. And it can be difficult to find the queen and to, again, get the queen into this new home and to get the majority of the worker bees into the new home. Oftentimes, if the goal is to get a colony out of a wall cavity or something like that, it's actually more effective just to, to unfortunately eliminate the colony and then open the wall up and, and uh, move all the uh, debris out. It, it can be a real challenge if you have 
bees nesting in the uh, wall cavities of a house. For sure. And then Barbara asks, how are you feeding this new hive? I think in the video. In the video, I was using a heavy sugar syrup. And I was actually, uh, one of the approaches that we were using with that, you can take a, uh, a freezer grade uh, a sealable plastic bag and put the sugar syrup inside the bag and then cut small slits into that and lay that on top of the, uh, the tops of the frames under the inner cover. And then the bees will not only get the sugar, but they also are able to get uh, the moisture with it as well. And it's, it's a good way, you know, in, in a small scale setting to, to get sugar syrup to bees quickly. Okay, and those are all the questions right now. Very good. Now, uh, if you're getting started in beekeeping, how many hives should you have? Well, you know, like, like a lot of things, oftentimes you hear the advice start small and that's, that's good advice for beginning beekeepers as well. But in my experience, you need more than one hive. And the reason for that is that part of hive management, there may be situations where you move frames from one hive to another hive. You know, for example, if you have a hive that is, is weak for whatever reason, moving uh, some frames of uh, brood and uh, capped bees, you know, you brush the, uh, the uh, nurse bees off, you move them without bees adhering into a new hive, uh, then the bees that are in the new hive will then take charge of those and you'll get a burst of, of new bees coming into the population of the second hive. So there can be situations where you can move parts of the hive around to, to balance out the, the health and vigor of more than one hive. And you don't really have that option if you have just one hive. And, and two, it's been my experience that, you know, if your goal is to, to develop a, a backyard apiary and you want to extract honey, you know, having more than one hive is going to give you the likelihood of having a reasonable harvest of honey from your, your, your uh, apiary. So uh, my general advice is to have somewhere from two to five hives. That's a good level at which to start. One hive, yes, you can certainly start with one hive, but you'll have more fun with, with more than one hive. Where should you place your hives? This is a good question. Um, in an urban setting, oftentimes we don't have a lot of choice, but if you have a rural property and you're trying to decide where to place the hive, here are some things to consider. Uh, keep in mind that your bees will forage some distance, uh, up to three miles, and you wanna set it up so that the activity in your hive doesn't interfere with other activities, either in your property or on surrounding properties. Um, we'll talk more about that when we get into the, the uh, discussion of urban bees, because that's definitely consideration in an urban setting. Bees require water and they require a lot of water, particularly during the warmer part of the year. And that water should be relatively close, okay? It's been a, a common source of concern uh, among neighbors of beekeepers when the bees from the neighbors end up drinking water from my pool or from my bird bath or you know, from some other water source on my property. So provide a water source that is close to the hives that is, is reliable and clean. Full sun is best. Uh, thinking about the hive opening, uh, particularly in urban settings, it could be helpful to have a barricade that ensures that the bees fly up and over an area. You know, for example, if your bees are, are uh, close to a property line, perhaps a fence in front of the hive will force the bees to fly up and they'll then gain some altitude before they end up over the neighbor's property. And keep in mind the bees and livestock do not mix. So there have been lots of situations where, where goats or, or uh, horses or uh, cattle have pushed beehives over. It's, it's, it's best to isolate beehives from areas where livestock are kept. Okay, now let's turn our discussion to honeybee IPM. And in recent years, we've seen a number of uh, uh, pest problems become serious on, 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 uh, with honeybees and with bee colonies. And it's part of beekeeping to help manage these problems to the advantage of your honeybees. And, uh, just a couple of things to point out in this picture here. We'll talk about this more later, but in the lower larger picture, the beekeeper is using a uh, bottom board that is screened and using a slide in board that slides below the screen, which she has placed a sticky substance on. And that is, is designed to catch varroa mites as the uh, bees groom them from their bodies. The uh, second picture over shows uh, small hive beetles. Those are the small dark beetles that are there amongst the bees. Uh, high enough populations of small hive beetles can be disruptive to a beehive. And there are various ways that we can manage small hive beetles without using 
pesticides in the hive. We have another question. Yes. Anonymous asks, can roadways be an issue with hive location? Roadways can be, can be a consideration because if bees have to fly at low altitudes across the roadway, they run the risk of being struck by vehicles, particularly if it's a busy roadway. Now, there are things that can be done to help with that situation. Uh, again, putting up a, a fence that forces the bees to fly up as they leave the hive or to have some elevation as they come down to the hive can be helpful in getting bees out of harm's way. But that would be the primary consideration that I would see. Another thing to consider is that um, there is some problem with thievery from the standpoint of hives and having hives close to a traveled road makes them a, a target for thieves. You know, if they're in plain view, then they become a target. Okay, that's it right now. Okay, very good. So here's an example of some of the uh, honeybee pests that have to be considered. And a number of these are, are not new problems. They've been around for some time, things such as uh, American fowl brood and nosema and chalk brood. But we are seeing the rise of, of uh, new problems such as um, these virus issues that are becoming a, a part of a, a sudden colony collapse disorder. Uh, these these uh, viruses are vectored by varroa mites and varroa mites in particular are a very damaging pest that is a recent arrival here in, in North America. Tracheal mites can be a problem as well and then small hive beetles. All of these are newly arrived pests. They, they uh, have all arrived within the past 25 to 30 years. Then we have some, some larger scale uh, predators of honeybees and these include uh, the uh, giant Asian hornet that we're hearing so much about. Um, yellow jackets will prey upon honeybees. There are hornets, though other types of hornets that will prey upon honeybees. And then of course, wax moths. The larva of wax moths will destroy the comb within a uh, honeybee hive. And then there's some vertebrate pests. Mice will shelter within hives. Uh, sometimes snakes and lizards can be found within hives. Skunks can be very damaging. Skunks will camp out at the entrance of a hive and eat the honeybees as they come and go. There are birds that make a specialty of catching and consuming honeybees, particularly in the vicinity of the hive. Bears, of course, are, are a very damaging pest of uh, beehives. They destroy the hive. They, they feed certainly on the, uh, the honey, but they're primarily feeding on the larval bees. And then, of course, livestock will push colonies over and otherwise damage colonies. And then I mentioned humans. Uh, you know, human activity, uh, certainly uh, uh, the use of pesticides can be a risk factor for, for honeybees. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these pests because, again, that's subject matter for a series of workshops in their own right, but I will mention varroa mites, and I've heard beekeepers describe varroa mites as honeybee ticks, and quite frankly, that's what they are. They feed between the body segments of bees, both adult bees and larval bees in the cells, and uh, yes, they cause damage here, but another way in which they cause damage is that they spread viruses from one bee to another bee. They reproduce in capped pupil cells. And you can see them if the uh, infestation is heavy enough, you can see them on the, uh, the adult bees. And if you see that lower picture there, you can see that bee is, is uh, being parasitized by two varroa mites. The threshold is two to 3% of the bees within a colony having varroa mites. Now, how do you know if two to 3% of, of the bees in the colony have mites? It, uh, it's done by sampling, by collecting a known number of bees and and sacrificing those bees and observing the uh, varroa mites that are present on the bees. And this can be done by, by placing a known number of bees into a sack and then placing alcohol in that sack and then collecting the varroa mites that, that, move, that are removed from the, the bees and counting them relative to the number of honeybees in the sample. But again, very damaging, very damaging pest, both in its own right, but also in the fact that it spreads bee viruses. So yeah, as far as, oh, go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, Roger says, wax moths got into my stored supers. What do I need to do before putting them back on my hive in the spring? Uh, before putting uh, supers back on that have had wax moth problems, you have to remove any of the, uh, the comb that has been contaminated with the, uh, the wax moth. If, if you have plastic foundation, you can scrape the uh, cells off of it and reuse the foundation. Uh, in, in other cases, you have to completely remove the, uh, the uh, uh, comb. You know, for example, if you're using uh, a beeswax foundation, completely remove the comb and then replace it, uh, uh, replace the foundation in the, in the frames before reusing it. Uh, as you draw supers off, and uh, particularly if you put supers into storage that have uh, uh, 
drawn out comb in them, you have to manage wax moth or it will get into them. And the ways that you can manage it on a small scale is by freezing the supers. And uh, that will, will destroy any wax moth larva or eggs that might be present. Or you can stack them up uh, sealed between the uh, supers. And then there are certain chemicals that you could place within the stack of supers, which will repel the uh, wax moths. And you can't use, uh, you can't use moth crystals. That's, that's first of all illegal and it leads to uh, unsafe residues of paradichlorobenzene in the comb. You have to use chemicals that are approved for that process. Great, that's the only question right now. Okay, let's talk about Varroa mite integrated pest management. The first step, of course, in any integrated pest management strategy is to monitor the population of the pest. And again, you can see uh, the beekeeper here placing a sticky board over a screened bottom board. And uh, this is a good way to, to just quickly monitor if there are any Varroa mite present in the colony. Most colonies have some level of Varroa mite present in them. And oftentimes the first warning is by observing a sticky board under the uh, the hive. If there is Varroa mite present, then it's useful to sample a known number of bees, as I mentioned before, by uh, sacrificing those bees. You can do this with alcohol. You can do this with a shot of ether from a, a can of starting fluid, or, or you know, there's various other ways to do it, and then counting the number of Varroa mites that are present. Uh, there are cultural practices that can help with management of Varroa mite. Uh, resistant strains of bees, those strains of bees that are hardy, and those strains of bees that have hygienic behavior where they tend to groom themselves more regularly and remove the Avroa mite uh, are, are, are good choices. And again, uh, bee breeders have been developing strains that have this hygienic behavior. Small cell comb, there's evidence that uh, using foundation that is just a tad smaller than traditional foundation will lead to cells that are a bit smaller and that these cells don't uh, uh, provide as good a uh, habitat for the uh, reproduction of Varroa mite than a more a traditional size cell. And then something that's called brood break is helpful as well. Mechanical practices, you can actually trap mites within drone brood. Uh, drones are, are um, uh, drone cells are larger than the cells for worker bees. And it also takes longer for the drone brood to develop. And so uh, beekeepers are actually placing frames that have a special type of foundation that has the larger size cell for drones, the, the worker bees draw it out, the eggs that are laid in those drone cells, um, uh, again, hatch into drone larvae, they become infested with varroa mite, they're capped, and then at that point, the uh, cells are taken out, and then they're destroyed. The, the, you know, we don't need the drones anyway, and we certainly don't need drones that have varroa mite within the cell that are reproducing. The screen bottom board is helpful. Powdered sugar, uh, dousing your, your powder or dusting your bees with powdered sugar can actually improve grooming behavior that act, helps uh, remove varroa mite. So that can be a, a mechanical way of managing uh, varroa mite as well. There are soft chemical practices using various aromatic substances such as thymol, formic acid, oxalic acid, and various acids found in hops can be helpful. And then there's amitraz, which is a hard chemical that can be placed in the hive at certain times. You have to be cautious with amitraz because it can contaminate honey. So it has to be used at the right time to help manage the varroa mite. Patrick, we have another question. Yes. Michelle asks, uh, so mites are pretty much expected even when buying newts commercially? Mites are pretty much expected. Uh, again, a reputable, reputable beekeeper will manage mites at a very low level in, in their hives. And then when they when they develop nukes from those hives, there'll be a very low level of, of uh, varroa mite. But sooner or later, varroa mite will will become a problem in hives that are not managed for, for varroa mite. Great, that's the only question. Let's talk about colony collapse disorder for a moment. And in 2006, it was noted that just a tremendous number of colonies were lost during that winter. You know, in a, in a more typical situation, beekeepers expect to lose about 10% of their colonies in a, in a given year. But we had losses as high as 60% in, in that particular season and then during that winter. And then what was most unfortunate is that most of the feral bee colonies were destroyed. And uh, this brought, uh, first of all, uh, the problem obviously was, was a serious issue for beekeepers, but it also brought the situation uh, uh, as far as the, the stresses the bees were facing to public awareness. 
And this was actually huge from the standpoint of, of uh, uh, putting public opinion on the side of beekeepers and helping address some of the, uh, the uh, factors that have led to colony collapse disorder. Now, uh, colony collapse disorder appears to be a complex. It appears to be a situation that arises when a colony is under several different stressors. Uh, it could be pesticide buildup and brood nests, and this could be uh, pesticides that are brought in as a result of foraging, you know, persistent pesticides that bees bring in either on their bodies or that might be present in nectar. It also can come about from lack of habitat, lack of forage. You know, for example, in situations where uh, uh, nectar and pollen forming plants have been eliminated. And then it's, it's certainly been tied to uh, the viruses that are vectored by Varroa mite. And so again, all of these are factors in colony collapse disorder. And uh, thankfully, uh, we're, we've seen some improvement in the situation. Uh, again, public awareness has played a role. Uh, we now see people who are deliberately planting habitat for honeybees. Um, and, and this obviously benefits not only honeybees, but also native pollinators. So planting habitat strips on farms or planting uh, pollinator gardens are all very helpful from this standpoint. Uh, reducing pesticide use whenever possible is certainly part of the solution to colony collapse disorder. And then uh, again, we've seen some changes, changes in public policy. You know, for example, we've seen changes in pesticide labels to highlight some of the risks in using pesticides relative to, to honeybees. And I think this is a very positive benefit and the people who are using these pesticides by law must abide by the provisions on the label. So I think that's very helpful. And again, this helps not only honeybees, but it helps all pollinators. Now, again, just to, to uh, review integrated pest management. And again, as, as beginning beekeepers, we have to understand that uh, we have to manage honeybee colonies for these problems. But again, uh, we wanna start with, with uh, physical management. Again, things such as hives on stands, proper angles of bottom boards, screen bottom boards, those sorts of things. Mechanical management, again, the using drone comb for uh, for all mite management, cultural management, uh, removing honey, processing promptly and, and managing uh, the, uh, the comb after honey extraction, very important from the standpoint of wax moth management, and then chemical management if needed. Use softer chemicals first. Uh, if you have to use harder chemicals, then use those as, um, as uh, uh, directed by the uh, label of the chemical. Well, now let's turn our attention to pollination. And particularly for those who are thinking about beekeeping on a larger scale, it can be uh, a very lucrative aspect of beekeeping to provide pollination services. If we look at this basket of uh, produce, uh, a number of the items in this that basket are there as a result of uh, honeybee pollination. So we wanna recognize the value of honeybees and pollination. So again, this is a, a link that we've known about for a long time. Again, that, that honeybee human relationship uh, was based as much upon honey as it was upon pollination. And as far as uh, beekeepers deliberately providing pollination services, this began back in the early 1900s. Now, as a uh, varroa mite has increased, we've seen a loss of feral bee populations. And this has had serious implications for, uh, uh, for example, fruit growers who are relying upon feral bees to pollinate their crops. When I first began my career uh, 35 years ago, it is now, uh, if you had a small scale orchard, in many cases, you didn't have to bring honeybee colonies into your orchard for pollination because you had lots of feral bee colonies in the vicinity of the orchard and they would, they would pollinate your, your crop for free. But with the rise of varroa mites and particularly the colony collapse disorder, we've seen the loss of feral bee colonies. And that need, means that we now need to bring honeybee colonies, managed colonies into crops to provide for pollination. Patrick, we have another question. Yes. Maggie asks, how often do you need to check your hives for issues? How often do you need to check your hives for issues? Well, you know, it's a bit of a balancing act. You don't want to open a hive up unnecessarily because it's a disruptive activity and and uh, it does take a while for a hive to, to uh, recover back into normal activity after examination. But uh, I would suggest examining bees at least monthly. And if you suspect a problem, then more frequently. Great, that's the only question. 
so again, the uh, plants that require pollination, it's a long list of, uh, of the uh, fruits and vegetables and, and, and other crops that, that, that we're associated with that we enjoy eating and that uh, are important parts of our diet. Now, in some cases like broccoli, we don't need pollination for uh, the harvest of the broccoli head, but we do need pollination from the standpoint of developing broccoli seed for the next crop of broccoli. So even something like broccoli where we don't eat a fruit or you know a portion that was pollinated, we still have to have seed to grow that crop. And that's where honeybees come into to that place. This is an interesting map. Uh, the estates that are, that are uh, colored in blue are states where there's large scale production of fruits and vegetables that depend upon pollination. And the, uh, the arrows show the uh, migratory movement of beekeepers. You know, for example, uh, many colonies are overwintered in the Southern US in Texas and, and Florida. And then they move out from there to different states in response to the pollination needs of crops. You know, for example, if we look at Maine, Honeybees are moving to Maine to pollinate the low bush blueberry crop. Honeybees move to Michigan to pollinate crops like cherries, apples, and blueberries. And notice all of those arrows going to California. Well, what's happening in California is a huge event from the standpoint of pollination, and that is the almond bloom. And let's talk a little bit about almonds. So almonds by far have the greatest needs from the standpoint of pollination and migratory beekeepers. It's a crop that is entirely pollinated by honeybees, and it's a huge crop. 70% of the world's almonds are produced in California. And again, uh, by the early 2000s, uh, almonds demanded more bees than any other crop. In fact, more than, than the combination of most other crops. And from January to March, during the almond uh, blossoming, there are likely more colonies of bees in California than there are in the rest of the country. And in fact, we're getting close to a point where we don't have enough colonies, enough managed honeybee colonies that can be moved to California to supply the number of colonies needed to pollinate the almond crop. It's, it's actually close to a crisis situation. So again, in 2013, um, if you want to, some numbers, we needed 31 billion honeybees to pollinate the 810,000 acres of California's almond crop. That's more than 1.5 million colonies. And uh, again, as I mentioned, we're, we're at a, a situation where we're, we're reaching a shortage of colonies. And that of course has driven up the uh, cost per colony for the, uh, the people who are growing almonds. And uh, those people who are supplying uh, honeybees, honeybee colonies for pollination, it's a $240 million industry, $240 million industry. And an almond grower is gonna pay anywhere from 150 to $200 per colony each time one is set out, you need um, you need several colonies per acre, and a beekeeper can actually move colonies around in response to blooming of different cultivars, different regions in in California. So, again, a lot of interest in uh, migratory beekeeping into California to serve a single crop, the almond crop. What about migratory beekeeping in Missouri? Well, we don't have a lot of migratory movement of hives, but we do have beekeepers who will move colonies to pollinate uh, the almond crop in California. But much of our movement uh, here in Missouri is, is local. And we do have crops in Missouri that do uh, require uh, the uh, services of pollination, the services of, uh, of beekeepers. And those include melons, pumpkins, apples. Uh, there are some small fruit crops like strawberries and uh, blueberries and blackberries that benefit from uh, the activity of pollinators and there are certain vegetables in addition to uh, uh, melons and pumpkins as well. Uh, it's less expensive to rent a hive here in Missouri. It's gonna be probably somewhere between 25 to $75 per colony. Watermelons, you need about one colony per acre. Uh, strawberries, one and a half colonies. Uh, apples, probably two to two and a half colonies per acre. And the exact number of, of hives needed depends upon several factors such as the uh, topography of the orchard, the size of the orchard, and the, uh, the uh, uh, need for cross-pollination versus self-pollination. Now, just some general thoughts on, on serving a uh, fruit grower or someone else growing a crop. You don't wanna place the hives until the crop flowers. In other words, about 10% bloom is the point where the uh, honeybee colony will pl be placed in the crop. You wanna place the uh, hives in clusters around the field 
Make sure that there's water available. As we mentioned before, water is crucial from the standpoint of honeybees. If any pesticides are being applied to the orchard or in the vicinity of the orchard, you must follow all label directions to protect the bees. And bees are vulnerable not only to insecticides, but also to other pesticides, such as herbicides and, uh, and fungicides. Uh, keep in mind that single pesticides are likely less lethal to bees than mixtures, and systemic insecticides are less lethal than topically applied products. In other words, something that's applied that uh, is less likely to contact the bee itself, it tends to be less, less toxic. And again, if you're providing colonies, you want to have a clause in your pollination contract that talks about pesticide use. And if the, uh, the uh, producer is intending to use a pesticide application, it's, it's good practice to notify the, the beekeeper 24 hours prior to application so that those hives can be moved out of the, the uh, planting before the pesticide is applied. Do we have any questions at this point, Anna? No questions right now. Okay. Now, in addition to pollination, there is uh, obviously the, the commercial potential of producing bee products. And this is a picture of, of that I gathered up just just from what I happen to have at home, and you can tell I'm a I'm a, a lover of bee products. But uh, things such as honey, beeswax, and uh, other bee products can certainly offer some economic potential for for beekeepers. Let's talk about honey and honey products first. Um, honey is twice as sweet as sugar, and it's all natural. I mean, what could be better than than honey as as a sweetener? Uh, honey bees convert nectar into honey. They collect nectar from a variety of blossoms, and you can actually develop specialty honeys based upon the uh, nectar, the uh, type of blossom that the nectar was collected from. And if we look at uh, this picture here, you'll notice in the very center that bottle of honey says sourwood honey. Sourwood honey is a good example of a specialty honey. It's it's um, uh, there's just a small quantity available. It's collected from the uh, blossoms of the sourwood tree and. Appalachia and the, the honey flow is a very short period of time, but it's a very valuable honey and it's a delicious honey. Uh, my favorite honey, quite frankly. But uh, uh, certainly specialized honeys offer opportunity. Now keep in mind that honey may crystallize, but it really doesn't spoil if it's stored properly. Um, as far as honey products, uh, you could certainly sell liquid honey as we see in that middle bottle. Over to the, uh, the uh, right is uh, an example of uh, creamed honey or whipped honey. And cream honey is, is uh, produced by uh, taking very small crystallized uh, the particles of very small, very small crystals from crystallized honey and blending it with liquid honey. And then through the, the process, you develop a smooth spreadable product that again is absolutely delicious. In that case, that's a jar that I brought home from a trip to, to Hawaii that was made from, uh, from uh, ohia blossoms. And then in, you can also uh, market what are called comb honey products. And, that little bowl there is a couple of pieces of uh, comb honey. And this can be marketed as chunks of, of, uh, of comb honey that's cut out of frames, or you can, you can uh, produce comb honey in specialized uh, circular uh, frames placed into a honey super. You can also uh, collect chunks of comb honey and suspend it in jars of liquid honey. But again, lots of different options from the standpoint of honey and honey products. The other bottle there is actually a combination honey elderberry product that is being promoted as a health supplement. And there are health benefits to, to honey consumption. And when you combine it with elderberries, it's, it's hard to beat the, uh, the health benefits of, of that particular product. So again, uh, honey has been used for nutritional and uh, medicinal benefits for, for centuries. And obviously an antimicrobial nature to honeys. Honey can act as a preservative uh, it's been used to treat burns, ulcers, and bed sores. It has the same caloric count as sugar, but uh, honey contains more nutritive value than sugar. In other words, there's more in honey than just sugar. There are actually uh, pollen grains and, and, and other substances that, uh, that have nutritive value. Raw honey is easier to digest and provides quick energy. Uh, pasteurization can be done with honey to retard crystallization, but there is some evidence that pasteurization can actually destroy enzymes and nutrients that are naturally found in honey. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, raw honey, there's definitely a market for that, even though it does tend to crystallize more readily than pasteurized honey. Um, you can buy honey directly from beekeepers, from farmers markets, from a retailer. Again, there's, there's lots of, of ways that a beekeeper could, could sell 
honey and honey products. Patrick, we have another question. Yes. Chris asks, with bees migration range being judged in miles, other than planting a large primary crop in their immediate vicinity, how, how do you limit the nectar used in a particular type or types of plants? Yes, that's a, that's a good point. Um, so oftentimes you can tell by the characteristics of the honey, what the uh, nectar source was. The other thing is bees tend to be uh, faithful to a nectar source as long as it's productive. You know, for example, um, uh, buckwheat pr produces a very dark, distinctive honey. And when buckwheat blossoms, there are lots of flowers and bees will actually remain faithful to the buckwheat honey flow until it's done flowering. The same thing happens in the spring when blackberries blossom here in, in southwest Missouri. Uh, in the case of sourwood, it flowers um, at a time when there's not much else flowering in the vicinity of those trees. And it's also a tree, it, you know, it's, it's flowering in a forested area where you don't have a lot of other plants uh, flowering on the ground. And so a beekeeper can actually move a colony close to a stand of sourwood trees, harvest the uh, honey flow off of those trees, and then move the colony, pull those supers off, and then extract a honey that is largely sourwood honey. Uh, the uh, clover honeys that are, that are uh, commonly available are harvested from huge, huge stands of uh, sweet clover in the Dakotas. In those areas, when the uh, sweet clover is flowering, there's not much else flowering and there's thousands of acres of sweet clover flowering. And so you have almost a pure clover honey in that setting. So there are ways to, to develop honeys that are distinctive based upon the nectar source. Great. And we have another question from Jessica who asks, what do you know about Manica honey? What do I know about Nanica honey? Other than I've tasted it and I know it's delicious, I don't know much about it. That's fair. That's respectable. Um, those are all the questions we have right now. Okay. Actually, we have one more. Yes. Um, do you have a quick list of the top several effective primary nectar sources that would be beneficial to plant? We have horses as well, but certain crops are not ideal for horses, for example, clover. Well, you know, from the standpoint of effective plants, those are the plants that produce an abundance of blossoms and an abundance of nectar. Uh, many of the plants that are legumes in the clover family fit that bill. Uh, buckwheat is another excellent example. Um, the, uh, there, there are field crops that can be uh, effective uh, nectar sources such as alfalfa and soybeans. Uh, keep in mind that with field crops, there, there can be the risk, obviously, of pesticide applications that might impact bees that are foraging in those areas, but those two crops can be a good source of, of nectar. Uh, here in southwest Missouri, there's typically a good, strong spring nectar uh, honey flow on blackberries. And so, you know, if you have uh, areas where there, there are stands of native blackberries, those can be a good nectar source as well. Uh, there are a number of, of commonly grown garden flowers that are good nectar sources. There are uh, commonly grown garden flowers that are good pollen sources as well. And keep in mind that pollen is just as important from the standpoint of, of colony health as, as uh, uh, nectar is. So those plants that produce an abundance of pollen are certainly helpful, uh, as helpful as those plants that produce an abundance of, uh, of uh, nectar for honey. Sure, and a follow-up question on that from Anonymous, uh, just ask sunflowers. Sunflowers are an excellent pollen source. And you can, you can um, now I have to qualify that because there are sunflower strains that have been developed that are pollenless. And obviously those are not going to be a good source of pollen. But uh, sunflowers are a much better pollen source than they are a nectar source for honeybees. But you will frequently find honeybees foraging on sunflowers for pollen. Great. And then Dana asks if you've ever had Tupelo honey. Oh, Tupelo honey. Yes, uh, Tupelo is, uh, uh, again, another forest tree. It, it uh, flowers in the spring and it can be, a again, if it's a present in large enough stands like sourwood, it can be the source of a very distinctive honey. It <clears throat> tends to be a milder honey, but again, very delicious. For sure. Okay. Looks like those are the questions for now. Another important bee product is beeswax. And bees produce wax from glands in their abdomens. And uh, particularly with uh, newly established colonies and swarms, they can produce large quantities of wax in a fairly short period of time. And, and obviously when we think of beeswax, we think of candles, but beeswax is also used in facial creams, lip balms, soaps, lipsticks, uh, various other cosmetics. 
and it has a use in pharmaceuticals. Uh, it's used in for, for dental applications too, and, and also for building. And uh, I always remember my grandmother, uh, she would keep a, uh, a button of beeswax close at hand and she would wax her threads as she was uh, quilting because it helped the thread slide easily through the fabric as she was quilting. So again, another use for, for beeswax. Other bee products, uh, from the standpoint of commercial production, there is a market for, for bee pollen. And uh, bee venom, interestingly enough, has medicinal benefits. And there is some interest in research into uh, some of those medicinal aspects of bee venom. Uh, you can, there's a market for the bees themselves from the standpoint of producing nukes or split colonies. Propolis, which is, again, that material that I mentioned before that bees use to uh, glue portions of their hives together, actually has some medicinal benefits as well. And it's used in uh, uh, toothpastes and, and, and other preparations. And then royal jelly, which is the, uh, the uh, uh, foodstuffs that uh, worker bees develop to feed developing queens. Uh, work, royal jelly has some medicinal benefits as well. So again, these are other bee products that could be produced and marketed. Well, let's talk a little bit about bees in the city. And uh, you know, those of us who are beekeepers, those of us who, who understand bees, recognize that there really is very little risk if bee colonies are managed and placed properly in an urban setting. But even so, for a, a good part of the public, the uninformed public, the idea of bees being close at hand is a bit scary. So it's important to, to think about some of these aspects before we start establishing colonies in urban settings. So the first step, of course, is to check the city ordinances. Uh, there are cities that have been very proactive in allowing uh, urban beekeeping. And then there's others who have laws in the book that prohibit beekeep, bees, bee colonies within city limits. So it's important to check the city ordinances first. Secondly, always, always have water available close to the colonies. As I mentioned before, nothing is more, uh, more uh, annoying to neighbors than having bees clustering around a swimming pool or, or a fountain or, or uh, a bird bath. And if you don't have water available, bees will seek it out. Position hive openings away from the neighbors. If, if possible, turn hive openings to the center of your property rather than towards the neighbors. Do what you can to alter flight patterns. As I mentioned before, if you place a barrier in front of the hive, it'll force the bees to fly up and gain altitude as they move out on their foraging flights. Educate your neighbors, invite them over to, to check out your hives and share with them some honey and, and just talk about bees and how exciting and how interesting they are and how valuable they are from the standpoint of pollination. And uh, before long, who knows, you may make some converts and pretty soon your neighbors will be keeping bees. And then again, very important to keep gentle bees only. You know, focus on those strains that are known for their gentleness. You certainly don't want bees that are aggressive or that are, uh, that are um, uh, it, where it's easy to trigger defensive reactions among the, uh, the bees in the colony. This is an interesting picture here. I had a chance to visit a community garden in Kansas City that had several beehives. And, you know, you think about, uh, beehives in a community garden, and you can, you, know, you can think about some potential problems, but this garden was very proactive and they actually placed their hives on top of tall poles. These poles were about 15 feet off the ground. And this did a couple of things. Obviously it altered the flight patterns of the bees so that they were well up into the air as they moved into and out of the hive. Uh, secondly, it kept the hives up where they were protected from vandalism. And that certainly is a consideration in a community garden. Now it was possible to raise and lower these colonies so that, uh, that the uh, uh, community gardeners could examine the bees. These were actually telescoping posts. I thought it was a very creative way to, uh, to have bees present in a community garden setting. Well, I thought I'd uh, check out the uh, laws in Springfield, Missouri. And I, I couldn't find uh, anything more recent than 2014, but according to the, uh, the uh, uh, Springfield Public Library and their listing of uh, beekeeping laws. This is what the laws read in Springfield, Missouri. You are allowed two hives on a lot that is at least 5,000 square feet, which is nice because as I said before, it's nice to work with more than one hive of bees. And for every additional 5,000 square feet of property, you can have an extra hive. So again, if you have a large city lot, there may be the potential to have several hives. Secondly, you have to know what you're doing. The law actually requires persons owning a hive 
to provide proof that they've had at least two years of experience in managing a colony of bees without reported incidents, or they've completed a beekeeping training course through a beekeeping association, an academic institution, or through a university extension program. And then all hives must be labeled with the owner's name and address. Okay, so that's the first part. And here's the second part. The beehives must be located in rear yards. So you can have bees in your backyard, but not in your front yard, at least five feet from all property lines. The hives must be inside a fenced enclosure that is at least 42 inches high. Again, here's an effort to alter the flight patterns of the bees and also to protect the bees from, from vandalism or from uh, perhaps children you know, getting too close to the, uh, the hives. If the hive is located within 20 feet of a property line, a six foot tall barrier that extends at least 20 feet in both directions is required. Again, an effort to alter flight patterns so that the bees are well up into the air before they move across a property line. And then a usable water supply for the bees should be located on the owner's property. And again, as I said before, that just makes common sense. So yes, it is possible to keep bees in Springfield, Missouri. In fact, uh, I would encourage you to consider it if you're an urban beekeeper in Springfield. So we'll close out with some five common mistakes to avoid. A first step, I'm not sure why I am keeping bees. <laughs> well, before buying the, uh, the, the first piece of woodenware or, uh, or uh, considering where you're gonna source your honeybees from, make sure you know why you're keeping bees. Are you a hobby beekeeper? Are you a backyard beekeeper? Or are you perhaps thinking about commercial scale beekeeping? And the reason this is important is because this is going to guide, first of all, your training. And then secondly, uh, you're going to have to be thinking about things in addition to just keeping bees if you're thinking about the commercial aspects of keeping bees. Secondly, there's only one way to keep bees. That's certainly not true. There are lots of ways to keep bees. As I uh, mentioned in the presentation, just looking at different types of hives alone, lots of different types of hive construction, lots of different um, uh, types of bees to keep, lots of different ways to actually manage hives. Third, I need to learn everything about bees before I start. Well, it's certainly good to have some basic understanding of beekeeping, but a lot of, of uh, beekeeping skills come with practice. They come with hanging around other beekeepers and they come with jumping in and, and buying or, or establishing that first colony and then that second colony and, and learning about what beekeeping is all about. So you don't have to know everything before you, you start. Uh, fourth, I have to have all of the equipment. I've got to have all the bells and whistles. I've got to have everything. Well, that's certainly not true. As I mentioned in the videos, yes, you do need some woodenware. Yes, you do need some basic protective equipment and some basic tools. And yes, you do need honeybees, but that's basically all you need. And you don't have to, again, you can keep the cost under control. And then finally, I don't want to spend money on bees. Well, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, it's important to remember that there is a cost to, uh, to beekeeping. <clears throat> And that you want to keep that in mind is, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. It's a good thing we're close to the end of the presentation. So <clears throat> at this point, I will, I will thank you and uh, give me a quick pause here to regain my voice and then we'll, we'll tackle any questions. Okay, do we have any questions? No questions right now. Well, again, I, I appreciate everyone joining us tonight and uh, sharing your passion with beekeeping with me. Those questions and <clears throat> that discussion really, really added to the workshop, but I thank you for that. Uh, as we move ahead, if you'd like more information on beekeeping, please feel free to reach out. Check out the uh, websites of the Missouri Beekeeping Association and the Ozarks Beekeepers Association. And if you're serious about bees, check out those, uh, those online uh, classes that were mentioned earlier. There's lots of ways to gain <clears throat> a knowledge of beekeeping. And uh, the, the fact that you're at the workshop tells me that uh, you're interested in this exciting and, and fascinating uh, hobby. And, and who knows, it may, it may grow into something larger than just a hobby. So Anna, at this point, any more questions? Um, no questions, but we have some very positive comments. Uh, Caleb says, thank you very much. Michelle says this was very helpful. Jack agrees, thank you for a very informative workshop. Um, Michelle says, associations in her area are still working on getting the training available virtually. Um, 
so yeah, lots of lots of positive comments. Oh, very good. Well, as we uh, as we leave the workshop, uh, please fill out the the uh, uh, evaluation survey that will come up automatically. We we value your feedback. It's very helpful. Again, as I mentioned, to help me improve in my presentations and to help us report back to our, our funders who helped support tonight's workshop. So again, with that, I think we'll go ahead and uh, close down the workshop and thank you all for joining us tonight.